Williams was there to head home. She won the FA Cup back in 2012 with Birmingham City. She might have another chance at the moment. It's Manchester United 2, Chelsea 0. So Manchester United on course, Tottenham Hotspur already there. Now from 8 o'clock tonight, Mark Chapman and the Five Live golf team will be live from Augusta National for the conclusion of this year's Masters. World number one, Scotty Scheffler leads going into the final round. He's seven under par, one shot clear of the field, and we can hear from the leader on how he's preparing for the final round. Managing my energy, managing my expectations. Um, you know, I've, I've talked about it a little bit, but I, I do have high expectations for myself, and um, I try to do my best to get that stuff out of the way in the morning. And by the time I get to the course, it's kind of getting into my own little world and just trying to hit shots. Um, you know, being patient out there, I think, is really important. Um, I think I, I try to feed off the energy from the crowd a little bit. It's nice walking onto these tee boxes and getting a nice ovation. It's it's a really nice feeling to have the crowd behind you, and uh, I try to embrace that as much as possible out there. So that's uh, Scotty Shepley. You can listen to the final round on Five Live from 8 o'clock tonight with a whole Five Live golf team and see whether he can get a second green jacket or whether somebody can come from behind and pip him to it. So 4.30, we'll be at the Emirates today for Arsenal against Aston Villa. We can say good afternoon for the first time this afternoon to Chris Wise. Chris, how much are you looking forward to this one? Hello, Fletch. Yeah, very much so. You find me at the moment, I'm just down uh, by the tunnel here at the Emirates Stadium, but there is such a sense of anticipation. I arrived about three hours before kickoff, and already even then outside the stadium, there were thousands of people milling around. There's a real sense of occasion here because Arsenal, of course, know that with every weekend that passes and with every win that they tick off and how many of those have they got already in 2024, they are going that little bit closer to getting that first Premier League title in 20 years. So there's an awful lot of excitement building here. It's going to be interesting, Chris, what Mikel Arteta does because he's faced with this dilemma of he knows he's probably got to win every game because he's expecting Manchester City to do that. But he's also aware that he's got Bayern Munich to come in the Champions League on Wednesday. I think that the team that he picks is going to be fascinating. It is. I mean, for me, really... Fletch, there's, there's two positions that are up for grabs in this Arsenal team at the moment, and that's left-back, and I'd imagine that Alexander Zinchenko will go back in there this afternoon. We saw Jakob Kivior, of course, play there against Bayern Munich during the week, but he was taken off at half-time and perhaps didn't have the greatest 45 minutes. And then, obviously, on that left-attacking part of that Arsenal front three, Gabriel Martinelli, you imagine, would get the nod, but does he bring Gabriel Jesus in today just to freshen things up a little bit? So he does have a couple of choices, Mikel Arteta. Whether he moves anyone else around within his 11, I'm not too sure he will, because, frankly, as important as that Champions League game is to them out in Munich on Wednesday night, this this today is is imperative, really, for Arsenal, and they're going to have to show that they're capable on, on fighting on two fronts between now and the end of the season if they're going to go all the way and take that Premier League title that they crave so much. Yeah, two sides to every story, of course. No Douglas Luiz today. He's suspended for Aston Villa. But the way it looks for the race for the top four, I mean, if they could get anything today, that's going to be significant for them from a Villa standpoint. Massive, absolutely huge, especially off the back of what happened to Tottenham yesterday um, because that, that mauling at Newcastle United, I imagine Aston Villa probably didn't expect that to happen, if truth be told. So suddenly the dial has moved back in their direction. They, ha they haven't even played Aston Villa so far this weekend and they've gone from fifth into fourth. So what an opportunity for them to double down on that, that position here. But the, the really interesting dynamic for me, Darren, about this game in terms of from an Aston Villa perspective is that Arsenal have had an extra 48 hours to prepare for this game. They played on Tuesday. Villa played in Europe on Thursday and had that taxing game against Lille as well where they were worked particularly hard. Plus with the injuries that Unai Emery is dealing with at the moment and as you say, no Douglas Luiz today because of suspension as well. So what will this Villa team look like and how much battery life will there be in the legs when we get underway at 4.30? Chris, looking forward to it. So that's to come at half past four. Chris Wise alongside Danny Gabadon. Now, don't forget, West Ham Fulham is on five sports extra. 1-0 to Fulham in the London derby at the London Stadium. Let's head back to Anfield, where it's a big 45 minutes coming up here for Liverpool, Ian Dennis. I've just seen the goal back again from various angles. I actually wonder whether any player's been that free to score a goal against Liverpool on that pitch all season. He just lost you there towards the end, Darren, because it coincided with the team coming out. I was just making the point, I mean, seeing the goal from various angles, I actually wonder whether any player has been that free to score a goal on that pitch against Liverpool all season. There wasn't a red shirt anywhere near, Ezra. No, no, from the cross from, uh, from Mitchell, he was given so much space. 
It's like he was taking a walk across Stanley Park, wasn't it, with the amount of room that he had either side of him. Canate didn't pick him up, Van Dijk didn't pick him up. Uh, Liverpool, though, have responded with making a change at half-time. Dominic Saboslai has come on and he has replaced Endo. Crystal Palace, well worth their lead. White shirt, sky blue shorts, uh, haven't made a change. We are back underway. BBC Radio 5 Live and BBC Sounds. Alisson in goal. Back four of Bradley, Van Dijk, Canate and Robertson for Liverpool. McAllister, Saboslai and Jones in the midfield. Salah, Nunez and Diaz are the front three. Liverpool all in red, playing from left to right, attacking the cop end against a Crystal Palace side in their white shirts and sky blue shorts that have Henderson in goal. A back three of Klein, Anderson and Lerma. Munoz and Mitchell are the wing-backs right and left, respectively. Hughes, Wharton, Eza, Elise and Mateta. The referee is Chris Kavanagh. And I would sense that, Neil Lennon, you're not surprised that Endo has made way for Sabosla. No, he had to make a change. There were two one pierced in midfield. Sabosla will give them energy and dynamism, but there's a, a worry here at the minute, Ian. Connor Bradley going to the challenge with Eze, and he's come out worse. Trent Alexander-Arnold is amongst the substitutes... Bradley getting tended to for Liverpool. When you think back that during COVID times, they suffered, I think it was six successive defeats here at Anfield. But in front of supporters, Liverpool's record, they've lost just one of their last 113 home league games in front of fans at Anfield. That was against Leeds United. Listen, don't talk to me about COVID. I went through the same thing at Celtic that season. As soon as the fans came back, Celtic were back to the best on the range. So I know exactly what Jurgen was going through without the without the fans. They're not the same club. They're not the same team. It's the same with big clubs like Celtic and your traditional big clubs. But they're not going to take any risks with Connor Bradley. Uh, Trent Alexander-Arnold is going to be coming on. So although they made that half-time change, this will be the first of three opportunities to make alterations in the second half. And Trent Alexander-Arnold, who's been back in training this week, he was an unused substitute against Atalanta on Thursday. He's missed 12 games with a, a knee injury. The England international is going to be coming on. And Connor Bradley, who's uh, done well as he's deputised, the uh, Northern Ireland international, is going to make way for Alexander-Arnold. So there is an early stoppage to the second half here at Anfield, where Liverpool trail Crystal Palace by a goal to nil. And Conor Bradley is being helped off the pitch. Yeah, he's a super young player, super talent, not only for Liverpool but for Northern Ireland. He scored the winner last month against Scotland. Uh, it's really sad to see him go off. He just seemed to go over on his ankle. It could be a bit of ligament damage. And it must be bad for him to go off because he's not he's a hardy boy, you know. It's exactly what Liverpool didn't want either. Not just the, the change in, but just the loss of momentum already. Well, there's a big hug for Trent Alexander-Arnold, and then there's a huge roar. The hug came from Jurgen Klopp, the roar came from the Anfield crowd as he takes to the field, and Liverpool, three minutes into the second half, are forced to make an, another substitution as they still trail by a goal to nil in a game, realistically, that they have to win. Crystal Palace created a number of chances in that first half. They're leading by a goal to nil. A Crystal Palace team that inflicted the first ever defeat when Jurgen Klopp was Liverpool manager. It was his seventh game in charge. They won by two goals to one back in 2015. As the ball is hit, hopefully, downfield by Canate and claimed by Henderson. It's going to be fascinating watching Alexander-Arnold. You know, he's been out for a while. In and out, you know, for a while, but um, you know, if he does go wandering, you know, Ezzy could take full advantage of that as well. But uh, when he's on the ball, he's a super player, as we know. Henderson holding on to the ball, flat clearance, straight it goes to McAllister. Saboslai, the substitute to Alexander Arnold. Salah, under pressure, didn't keep the ball in play. It'll be a Crystal Palace throw. I mean, you mentioned it, well, we both mentioned it in the first half, you know, this unusual looking back three. But Lerma for a midfielder, he has done exceptionally well today. Ian, he's been outstanding. He's been so aggressive in the tackle. He's read the game brilliantly, he's covered the ground well. And it looks like he's played there all his career. He's been brilliant first half. Really aggressive in the challenge and really good on the ball, obviously, because he's a midfield player. But it just shows the flexibility of these kind of players, you know, they can slot into different positions and make it look 
comfortable. Crystal Palace without a win in 10 away games in the Premier League since Burnley in early November. Still lead by a goal to nil. Five minutes into the second half, Anderson hoists it out towards the far side, headed on by Munoz. Canate to Van Dijk, early forward ball to McAllister midway through his own half, out towards Robertson, far side the left, Nunez makes the run, Anderson though again is there to head it out of play, Jones wants to take it quickly on that far side the left. After this game, our attentions will turn to... Arsenal against Aston Villa, commentary of that from 4.30 at the Emirates. Liverpool at the moment not taking the opportunity to go to the top of the table. Arsenal might, Manchester City yesterday beating Luton Town, boosting their goal difference. Talked about goal difference earlier on in the programme. Today for Liverpool it's all about securing the three points. Mitchell lets it run out of play, marshals it safely out for a throw. Can't fault Crystal Palace really, can you? It just looked a really good side, competent. Just wonder how much the first half might have taken out of them. We'll see as we go along in the second half. But yeah, they look comfortable at the minute. I haven't seen Liverpool give the ball away as much under no pressure Ian, for a long, long time. I don't know if it's a psychological thing or fatigue from Thursday night, but they've got to shake it off now. You know, they've got, well, 45, 15 minutes to win this game and keep themselves in the title hunt. Well, Liverpool, who've won the most points from losing positions in the... Premier League against the Crystal Palace side that have lost the most points from winning positions with 23. Here is McAllister on the halfway line left of the centre circle, seven minutes into the second half here on Five Live. Stroked in field by Jones to Van Dijk, closed by Mateta. Canate, pressed then from Eze, blocked by Hughes. Header from Mateta goes straight to Sabosli, who gives it away. Neil Lennon just talking about Liverpool being sloppy and now Hughes can come forward and he chips the ball into the path of Eze. Eze with a first-time cross, Elise had made the run, going to be kept alive by Munoz, far side the right. Munoz beats his man, pulls it back, Elise, there's a man over, it's Wharton, plays finished, blocked by his own player. Mateta goes there into the challenge with Sabosli. The referee gives the free kick in favour of Liverpool inside their own penalty area. So lucky. Liverpool are so lucky to still be in this game. That's uh, Alexander Arnold give the ball away, then Sabozza give the ball away, and Palace almost punished them. Now it's with Robertson. Robertson darting in towards the penalty area, then he slips, taken over by Nunez. And Nunez, the angle was extremely tight, and it goes out of play for a goal kick. Champions Cup quarter final, Toulouse Exeter, latest from Adam Whitty. Toulouse 7, Exeter 3, Toulouse have stifled a promising Exeter start. Henry Slade's early penalty cancelled out by a gorgeous move, finished off by France fly half Roman Untermack under the post. Toulouse 7, Exeter 3, 10 minutes gone. Manchester United's women lead Chelsea in the second FA Cup semi-final by two goals to nil, live on BBC One. The right to play Tottenham, who beat Leicester City 2-1 after extra time. In the Scottish Premiership, Celtic still have a four-point lead over Rangers after Ross County beat second-place Rangers 3-2 earlier. West Ham nil, Fulham 1 in the other game in the Premier League at 2. That's on Sports Extra. We've got the final round of the US Masters from Augusta on BBC Radio 5 Live from 8 o'clock tonight. But this is the Premier League. BBC Sounds and 5 Live Sport, eight minutes into the second half, where Liverpool still trail by that Eberichia as a goal after 14 minutes. Bizarrely, Crystal Palace have won more games in the Premier League at Anfield than they actually have at Selhurst Park. And they're looking for a fourth success here at this ground. Alexander-Arnold, diagonal ball, inside, Sabosli to Salah. Salah with Lerma, gets a throw. Back it goes to McAllister, Alexander-Arnold to Canate. On the halfway line now to Van Dijk. Runs forward, left of the centre circle, out towards Robertson, central area, just in from the left touch line. Van Dijk finds McAllister centrally. Hughes goes to close him down. Canate passes the ball forward. Jones now to Nunez. Nunez with the turn, holds onto the ball, works it onto his right foot, back seals it to Salah. Salah with the cross. Jones was there, challenged by Munoz. Goes out for a corner kick. Corner kick to Liverpool, still trailing. Do you know what? The, any time they've had good build-up, it's when Canati's played it into the, the forward area. It was a great ball into, I think it was Nunez, or Diaz, Diaz the Nunez, Nunez little back heel to Salah, good ball in, brilliant defending from Nunez, I have to say. You know, that, that was a goal. You know, Curtis Jones just about opened his body up. 
Nun, uh, Munoz gets a touch on it. Corner kick, downward header, Nunez! Saved by Henderson by his legs from close range. And then the header from Wharton goes out of play. From the downward header, it was hit straight at the keeper, and Henderson denies it. Ian, he's got the score, he's got the whole goal, he's just headed straight at Henderson. Brilliant reactions from Henderson, but, wow, what a, that's the biggest chance of the day by anyone. He's six yards out, the ball's bounced up lovely for him, and he's hit it straight at the goalkeeper. Great save from Henderson, but should have been a goal. So Vosli with a corner on this right-hand side, flying header by Lerma at the near side of the six-yard box, went across the face of goal, glanced off his head, Salah sends over the cross from the left, so Bosley tries to lay it off first time, doesn't control it, Crystal Palace are able to break, they're always a threat on the counter-attack, Nunez stops Eze, so Bosley tidies up, McAllister now comes forward, it's done by the cop, Nunez now right corner of the area, Nunez with the cross, Salah's heavy touch directs the ball straight towards Henderson, Palace still lead by a goal to nil. Yeah, I'm not sure it was directed for Salah, it might have been Diaz, but much better reactions when they lost the ball there. Nunez and Sabo say working really hard to get it back and recycle the ball and start again. And now you can hear it in the crowd, the crowd are feeling it as well. Better spell for Liverpool this, far better. Henderson clears it away, all in green away towards our right. Canate back pedalling, heads it forward, cushion header to Alexander Arnold from Saboslai, the England international switches play out towards Robertson, midway through his own half, shy of the halfway line now. 11 minutes into the second half here on BBC Radio 5 Live. Not many people saw this with a title twist. They might have predicted when you look at Liverpool's run of fixtures coming up, Fulham away, Everton away, West Ham away, indeed they're not back at Anfield until the 5th of May against Tottenham Hotspur. But Crystal Palace to put a spanner in the works here as the clearance from Anderson, only as far as Robertson. Forward ball is behind Jones, another errant ball out for a Crystal Palace throw. Well, there's been too much of that today, hasn't there? Just misunderstandings between, you know, pairs. And again, you know, Curtis Jones has gone ahead of the ball before Anderson, uh, Robertson's even got under control. And as he's played it, he's on the moves. Just breaks up the momentum again. Sometimes you read a statistic and you think, you know, it's a little bit bizarre or quirky. Uh, Liverpool have, have scored more goals in the last 15 minutes of games this season than they have in the first half. That's incredible. 27 in the last 15 minutes. They've scored 25 in the first half this season. So in well, terms, this is set up for a senior, isn't it? It's set up for a. You take a grandstand finish anyway, but the. I always think you've got to get a, a goal in the first 15, 20 minutes of the second half just to give you that impetus for the last 20 minutes or so. Crystal Palace fans will not need reminding that they've conceded 22 goals in the last 15. If we're to get a grandstand finale here at Anfield in the sunshine, won't do much for the nerves of Liverpool as they still trail. Munoz chests the ball back, cleared by Clyde, only as far as Curtis Jones, Wharton battling away in the midfield. Said he was being impeded, the referee says not. Liverpool now with McAllister, infield to Alexander-Arnold. Crystal Palace, to their credit, though, are still working so hard in the midfield. Hughes, Wharton, Elise and Eze. As the ball is rolled out towards that far side. How's it started at West Ham, Sahel Sahi? We've played an hour now here, Ian. It's still West Ham nil, Fulham one. Much better from West Ham in this second half, but the best chance in this second 45 minutes has fallen to Fulham once again. It will be played through from midfield, inside the penalty, a right-hand side, right-footed shot, top save from Fabianski, low down to his right-hand side. Still West Ham nil, Fulham one. And commentary of that on Sports Extra. Van Dijk, forward ball out towards that far side, the left. Diaz now takes over, running forward on that left touchline, sends over the cross, blocked by Munoz, his fellow Colombian, behind for a corner kick in front of the cop, 1-0 Palace. There's definite momentum sh shifting because Palace is starting to look a little bit sloppy in possession, and Liverpool have got the forward momentum now. They're forcing the ball, they're forcing the game, exactly what you'd expect from Liverpool. Palace are just starting to wobble a little bit. Corner kick, far side the left, it's an out swinger, comes out towards Salah, bounced away off his left thigh and just enabled Crystal Palace to get the ball away. We're approaching the hour mark, Palace still have the lead. Alexander-Arnold volleys the ball in field, Canate with a little flick, Van Dijk tries to tee up Diaz, stumbles on the edge of the area, Crystal Palace still working manfully, so boss line mishits that and completely slices it high and into the cop and out for a goal kick, and it's still Palace with the advantage. Again, wrong option. So 
he has a shot on it, Zabaze, but it's high, wide and handsome, and he should have just took a touch, rolled away to Robertson, kept the kept the pressure on Palace. It just gives Palace a little bit of a breather because they just just come off it a little bit at the minute. The midfield's still working ever so hard, but the front three at the minute can't get back into the game the way they were in the first half. That uh, defeat against Atalanta on Thursday was Liverpool's first at home in 34 games since Real Madrid in the Champions League of February 2023. You have to go back to October 2022 for their last defeat at home in the Premier League against Leeds. Since then, undefeated in 28, but trailing by a goal to nil as Eza, the goal scorer, just pulls the ball away from Sabosli, tries to release Mateta. Runs in front of Canate, who's now back goal side, holds the ball up, tries to drop his shoulder, they've doubled up on Mateta, uses his strength to get away from McAllister. Canate, though, wrestles it away from Mateta. He's pinned back inside his own half, finds an outlet in his goalkeeper, Allison to clear it, headed back by Lerma. Hughes tried to direct his header towards Mitchell. Alexander-Arnold came under pressure from Morton. I mean, the work rate from the midfielders from Crystal Palace has been they have great in there, haven't they? Great, Wharton and Hughes have picked up so many scraps and 50-50s have done a great job. Head down, Robertson runs forward, cross strikes the back of Diaz, presents Anderson with a header away. Hughes towards Wharton, Wharton lets it settle, back it goes to Klein, forward towards Wharton again, takes it neatly into his stride. Elise, challenge, referee, has a good look at it, Mateta holds onto the ball under pressure, back it goes towards Hughes, Hughes slides into the challenge, loses out, referee gives a free kick in favour of Liverpool. Hughes is not happy about that, they've taken the free kick quickly. Out towards Luis Diaz, Liverpool still looking for an equaliser. Nunez can't run it forward, blocked to Bosley, to Salah, laid off. Alexander-Arnold hits it first time right-footed on the rise, just outside the D into the cop. Still Palace lead by a goal to nil, they have a goal kick. Yeah, it's good from Liverpool, good pressure, but I did feel there was a foul on Hughes. But they've worked it well from a quick free kick. Diaz stepping inside, goes all the way across to uh, Alexander-Arnold, gets the shot away. But again, no real conviction in it, Ian. It's a half chance, really. Just seemed to be a little bit rushed for the final bit of play, Liverpool. And that comes with the tension, obviously, chasing the game. Liverpool have it all to do. Time is ticking away. 62 minutes played. Palace still with the lead here on 5 Live. Commentary from 4.30 to come. Arsenal against Aston Villa. Champions League quarter-finals will give you a choice of listing on Wednesday. Manchester City, Real Madrid on 5 Live, Bayern against Arsenal is on Sports Extra and on Thursday the Europa League quarter-final we will be in Bergamo for Atalanta against Liverpool and they've got it all to do to try and turn it around in that second leg after they were humbled here against the Italian side Alexander-Arnold clears it away downfield, Nunez will give chase Lerma lets it run out of play for a throw to Crystal Palace update in the Champions Cup in the Rugby Union, Adam Whitty to lose seven, extra 13. The Chiefs lead, lead in the south of France. Ethan Roots barging down the door to dot down after a tap and go. Great start from the visitors. To lose seven, extra 13, 18 minutes gone. There is activity on the bench down below for Liverpool. They've got Elliot, they've got Jota, Gakpo as well. You can see that Jota's going to be coming on and Gakpo as well. So we said about time running out. They're calling for reinforcements, Jurgen Klopp because they can't afford to lose this game, can't afford to draw it, they've got to win it. Here is Alexander-Arnold, swings over the cross from the right-hand side, headed away well by Munoz, picked up by Curtis Jones, far side the left, in the sunshine here at Anfield. Van Dijk just outside the centre circle of the Crystal Palace half, the white shirts drop behind the ball. Jones midway through that Palace half. Back it goes to Van Dijk. Full backs are pushed on. Canate gets the ball back from Sabosli. Then he goes out to his left for Van Dijk. Van Dijk waits. The Liverpool crowd try and play their part. Sabosli along the ground. Alexander Arnold, early ball in field. Luis Diaz can't roll away from Anderson. Too strong for him. Mitchell on this near side, the left. Down the line it goes. Eze out of play. It'll be a Liverpool throw. And it will be Gakpo for Nunez and Jota coming on for Luis Diaz. The changes that will be made very, very soon by Jurgen Klopp. Those two substitutes are just getting the final instructions here at Anfield. We've been playing for 64 minutes. Liverpool still trail. There's a challenge from Nunez on Jones, free kick to Liverpool. It's quickly taken. 
as the ball is played out by Diaz out the far side, work it back, then in central area for Alexander-Arnold. Van Dijk out to the left-hand side, back with Van Dijk once again, substitutes a limbering up in front of us, Liverpool being patient, just trying to prise open this Palace defence. Salah can't find a way through at the minute, just playing in front of Palace. Yeah, but they've definitely got a clamp on the game now, you know, Palace look, you know, a little bit tired. Ez is not having any sort of effect on the game now, they've sort of... Uh, clamped down on that sort of area of the pitch that he was getting a lot of joy in in the first half and now it's all possession for Liverpool at the minute. Great ball. Ball towards Salah, running forward, right side of the area, knocks the ball back with his head to Saboslai. Saboslai's cross charged down by Lerma, forward ball to Eze, lays it in field towards Hughes, first time ball for Mateta to give chase, Konate comes across, out of play, it goes for a throw. These are the changes that will take place. Meanwhile, let's go to Manchester United, Chelsea in the Women's FA Cup semi-final, Sani Rodovagela. Well, the holders have a foothold in this game, it's now Manchester United 2, Chelsea 1, Lauren James, the former red, side-footing inside the area, high into the roof of the net, Chelsea back in it, it's Manchester United 2, Chelsea 1, we are into the final moments of injury time. So Nunez comes off, Gakpo is on, Luis Diaz comes off, Diego Jota comes on, he came on the bench against Atalanta on Thursday night after missing the last 11 with a knee injury, and now you've got a front three of Salah, Gakpo and Jota, as with 24 minutes remaining, plus added on time, Liverpool need realistically need to find two goals as they trail 1-0. Yeah, and they don't want to leave it too late. You don't want to equalise your nearly ninth minute and sort of scramble for the winner. They're in control of the game. They're still not playing their brilliant football, but they've definitely got control of the game. They've been a lot better defensively, certainly in the second half. It's just about getting that breakthrough now. Ian. Ball for Saboslai. Comes back towards it. Mitchell. Gakpo quickly involved. Links up with Salah. Gakpo with a cutback. Jones couldn't take it in his stride, much to the agony of the, uh, the cock. Robertson with a cross, blocked by Klein on that far side. All he needed to do was just get a touch, did Jones, with a goal in front of him gaping. Liverpool now knocking at the door. Gakpo now on that left-hand side. We're almost midway through the second half. Crystal Palace defending stoutly, still leading by a goal to nil. No. Ball played forward straight through to Henderson, gathers it in safely. Massive chance, Ian. Brilliant play from... Uh... <clears throat> Salah and Gakpo and a brilliant pullback from Gakpo. How Curtis Jones doesn't get contact on it, I just don't know. They're looking at a handball here as well, but not too sure that the, his arm's out, really. Andy Robertson was adamant it was a penalty. We're looking at it again. Uh, I think it'd be difficult to give that. Jordan, are you is going to be coming on? Elise is the player who's going to be coming off. Uh, he had that last 16 minutes against Manchester City, but they'll have to just manage him and nurture him and get him, ease him back in, will Michael Luce after that thigh injury. So, Jordan, are you to come on? Half-time, Manchester United 2, Chelsea 1 in that second Women's FA Cup semi-final with the right to play Tottenham in the final. So, are you is on for Elise. And we're midway through the second half, so a quarter of the game remains and Liverpool still trail by a goal to nil. Here is Jota, far side, Gakpo on the left-hand side, coming in field now. Finds Alexander-Arnold inside the centre circle, forward ball. Jota's made the run, Anderson has been immense at the back for, uh, for Crystal Palace with the header away, only as far as Alexander-Arnold, short diagonal ball to Saboslai. Now out towards Salah, early ball in, Saboslai plays it across, and Anderson with the outstretched clearance in front of his own goal, directs it up and over the bar and into the cup for a corner kick. Oh, what outstanding football. Great one-two between Sal and Zabaze, and then a brilliant cross, and just outstanding defending, world-class defending from Anderson. How he got to that and kept it out of the net is beyond me. Much, much better from Liverpool. They've been really good second half. You feel as if a goal is coming. Zabaslai so with the corner. It's an outswinger. Van Dijk with the header was off target and desperately trying to get on the end of it was Jota with a lunge at the far post, and it went probably a yard in front of him, and out it goes for a goal kick and Henderson is testing the patience of the cop and the Liverpool supporters as he bides his time with the goal kick just over 20 minutes remain Liverpool nil, Crystal Palace won really good last 15 minutes Ian from Liverpool much much better, much more like them alright they've been sloppy a little bit in possession but they're really trying to force us you can't fault their attitude it's just that 
just that killer touch now they need just to top it off and then if it gets the 1-1 you know it's going to be the Alamo for the, the remainder of the game despite going back to the top of the table last night Manchester City's destiny before today was still out of their own hands the advantage still was with Arsenal and Liverpool if they were to win their remaining games Liverpool would lose that right we'll have commentary of Arsenal Aston Villa from 4.30 but Liverpool are still pushing as they trail. Gakpo on the left-hand side with the cross, headed out by Lerma under pressure, helped further away by Wharton, headed back by Canate, stabbed forward by Munoz. Yayu loses the ball, Gakpo, there's an intensity about Liverpool now. Jones with the cross, Jota couldn't get there, Mitchell tucked in, prevents it from reaching Salah, and Crystal Palace can break, and Ayu was tripped by Jones, he's going to get a yellow card, that'll be a free kick. We mentioned that game at the Emirates, team news from Chris Wise. Changes from the draw with Bayern Munich, Zinchenko, Trossard and Jesus in for Kivior, Jorginho and Martinelli. Villa have made two alterations from Thursday. Bailey goes to the bench, Douglas Luiz is suspended, Diaby and Zaniolo come in. Danny Gabidon joining Chris Wise for commentary at half four. And there's been a goal at West Ham, Sahel Sahi. A second for Fulham, a second for Andres Pereira on the counter-attack. It's West Ham nil, Fulham two, a raid down the right-hand side. Low ball into the penalty area, and he wasn't going to miss from seven yards away. West Ham nil, Fulham two. And after 6.06 and that Arsenal-Aston Villa game, a reminder that the US Masters final round from 8 o'clock with Mark Chapman and the team will be live here on 5 Live. Anderson with that free kick eventually taken, drilled downfield. Alexander Arnold's header will go back towards Allison. And there are 18 minutes remain, and Liverpool still trail by a goal to nil. Yeah, 18 plus add ons. Yes. So we're looking at a good 20 minutes, plenty of time. But it, you know, I'm just looking at the body language of the Palace players. Playing went down, Lerma's been holding his hip. He's just starting to look a little bit fatigued, which we felt because it put so much into the first half. You know, Liverpool couldn't play as badly as that again, and to be fair, they are playing very, very well at the minute. It's a boss light, infield to Jones, it might still reach, the boss light pulls it back, Trotter, what a block that was! That was Nathaniel Klein, that looked a goal for all the world, and then Nathaniel Klein, not quite on the goal line, but inside his six-yard box, gets the block in. Well, suppose they get the other side of Anderson, rules it back, it's a dolly for... I should just roll it in the corner. It's brilliant from Klein to get his body there, but that's an absolute sitter. Corner kick for Liverpool, still trailing 1-0. It's an outswinger from the far side. Van Dijk is up, and his header drops, and is caught by Henderson, who holds on to it all in green inside his penalty area. 17 minutes remain. <laughs> that's two unbelievable chances. You think of the Nunez one in front of the goal, and now the Jattel one. And the Liverpool fans were thinking, and Jurgen Klopp, is this going to be our day? Henderson, at some point, I would imagine, is going to get a yellow card for time-wasting. He's starting to test the patience of the Liverpool crowd. They'll be putting pressure on referee Chris Kavner. Meanwhile, Chris Kavner awards a free kick in favour of Crystal Palace. Haven't been as much as an attacking force in this second no, half. No, they haven't. You've got to give Liverpool credit for that. They've tidied up the issues that they had to deal with in the first half. Eze has been very quiet. Obviously, Elise has gone off the pitch. Ayu's on, really, to get Palace up the pitch now. It's basically we have what we hold. But they're hanging on at the minute because Liverpool are really, you know, coming on strong. And to be fair, they've created some great chances in. Well, they've got this free kick. It is left of centre. Midway through the Liverpool half, they're attacking the Anfield Road end, playing from right to left as we look. As of the goal scorer, right-footed curls, it hangs in the air, and Mateta is there! Oh, my and goodness! What? Oh my Was that a save from Alisson? Yeah. Oh He's hit it at point-blank range, it's rolled up the goalkeeper, Mateta can't believe it. I've never seen anything like that. And it's all the world, the goalies... He puts out a big army and saves it. It's incredible. Absolutely incredible. It's kept Liverpool in the title race. What a strong arm that was from Alisson. Mateta from close range. So Alisson and Robertson in the first half have stopped Palace leading and taking a two-goal lead in this game. Eze with the corner kick, far side the left. Mitchell, far side. Hammered away then by Alexander-Arnold. If all of a sudden Palace had gone 2 up, but now all of a sudden it's Jones who's released. Jones inside the penalty area. Jones has put it wide. What a chance that was for Liverpool, and it has been squandered. This game is bonkers. It's absolute. I've never seen misses like this in my life. What a counter-attack. Brilliant from Gakpo. 
releases Jones, he's clean through, one-on-one, -on -one, gets across the defender, steadies himself and puts it wide. It's an incredible miss. And the, the Mateta miss was even worse. Two yards out, blasts it, and Allison makes the save of a, a lifetime. I, that will be reeled over and over again for years to come. What an arm that was. Well, all of a sudden, it's a huge let-off at one end for Liverpool because you couldn't see them scoring three goals in 15 minutes, which is what they would have required. And then at the other, a chance to level. And Jones really should have made it 1-1. Oh, he should, yeah. I mean, that's three clear-cut chances Liverpool have had, but none as clear-cut as the Mateta one. I mean, this game could be 3-3, you know? Um, the lack of finishing, brilliant goalkeeping, it's had a bit of everything. And the whole thing surrounding it all, Ian, is the tension around the stadium and the significance of what lays ahead of us in the next 15 minutes. They're going to be a triple change for Crystal Palace. Riedebelt is going to be coming on. Joel Ward is a, another player. And also Jeffrey Schlupp is a, another one for, uh, for Crystal Palace. And fresh legs as Oliver Glasner looks to get these three points here at Anfield. Nathaniel Klein will go off. That will be Ward who will replace him on the right side of that three-man defence. Nathaniel Klein, a former Liverpool player, taking his time. Hughes is the player who's going to be coming off for Riedeveldt. He's worked ever so hard. He turns 29 on Wednesday. It's his birthday. So Riedeveldt, who's missed the last six games, will come on for, uh, for Will Hughes. And the other change will be Jeffrey Schlupp for the goal scorer. Everichia Ezer. So Crystal Palace going into defensive mode, where we're at that time, inside the last 15 minutes, where Liverpool have scored the most goals in the Premier League, Crystal Palace have conceded the most, and the fourth official, amidst all of that, is struggling to work the electronic board, which isn't helping matters. Yeah, and Liverpool players are getting after Chris Kavner, telling them to get a move on. It's just, you know, the dark arts, if you want to call it that, from Crystal Palace, they're slowing the game down, they're trying to break the momentum up that Liverpool have had. But uh, this game is just, you know, I haven't seen a game like this for a long time in terms of, you know, quality chances being missed and just the excitement and the tension around the stadium at the minute and what it means to particularly Liverpool at the minute. With your experience of winning a title, if Liverpool don't win this game... I think they're out of it. They're out of the championship. Yeah, I think so, yeah. And to be honest with you, they don't look like a championship winning team today. You know, even the Mateta chance, Ian, it was a free kick, it was a free header for Anderson to head it down, and Mateta's two yards out with a free hit. You know, you can't afford to do that. There's another turnover. Salah gave the ball away, tries to win it back, slips. There is a desperation now inside Anfield amongst the growing frustration, anxiety amongst the supporters, which you can certainly feel here at Anfield. Canate, they're scrambling Liverpool, and time is running out. 12 minutes of normal time remain. Curtis Jones out towards Robertson. Robertson running forward over the halfway line. Palace still lead by a goal to nil. Gakpo, six yards inside the Palace half. Canate out then towards Alexander-Arnold. Remember, you have to go back the three years since the last time that Liverpool in back-to-back -back games failed to score here at Anfield. Gakpo on the far side, the left, delivers the cross, headed out by Anderson. Been absolutely outstanding at the back for Palace. Van Dijk forward, Canate plays it, lifts it over the top, it's a heavy touch, Jota can't keep it in play. Goal kick to Crystal Palace, and 11 minutes remain. And Jurgen Klopp, deep in thought in that technical area. Well, I think the referee has to have a word with Henderson as well. You know, he's really sort of milking it now, you know, the, the time wasting, he's going from one side of the box to the other, which is his right to do, obviously, but it's been going on you know, for the last 20 minutes now or so, and you can feel the frustration, not just from the, the fans, but the players as well. But it's been exhilarating to watch this game. Can't take your eyes off it, Ian. And it's certainly full of drama for what's at stake. There is a real jeopardy as Liverpool Jones couldn't take it forward into his path, desperately trying to win the ball back. They do so. Turnover in the midfield, Jones. Crystal Palace, though, are fighting for everything. Ryderbelt just snapped his way into the challenge. You might remember that 3-3 game at Selhurst Park 
Ten years ago, next month, when Crystal Palace produced three goals in the last 12 minutes to draw 3-3 at Selhurst Park to dash Liverpool's title hopes that year. We've got 12 minutes remaining. Liverpool need two. There's Van Dijk to McAllister. McAllister 25 yards out. Not much of an atmosphere inside Anfield. There is a sense of growing frustration from this crowd as Mateta comes forward, plays it out towards Schluck, couldn't take it, bypassed him. Forced out wide on this left-hand side. Mitchell in field, Wharton been, had a terrific game in the midfield. Schluck, that was a weak cross. Allison will claim it, no he won't, Van Dijk will get there before him. Downfield to Salah, hooks it downfield. Alexander-Arnold might have been offside, instead he hits a diagonal ball that was too hurried, straight through towards Henderson. There's a lack of composure about yeah, Liverpool's play. I thought he picked the wrong ball again. It was just a little round the corner ball that Jotta, Jotta was in at a 2v1. He's just trying to lash one across the gap. It was such a high tariff to do, and the simple ball was Jotta. So, again, there's just that anxiety around the players as well. They've needed the goalie, and I'm not worried he is. They might get a goal, but it might be too late to win the game. Harvey Elliott is going to be coming on for Liverpool. When the two sides met at Selhurst Park, it was Harvey Elliott who got a 91st-minute winner. Liverpool need an equaliser first before they can have any notions of a winner here as they're toiling. Sir Boss Light out towards Van Dijk. Robertson. Now it's with Curtis Jones. Final instructions given to Harvey Elliott. Back it goes to Van Dijk. Alexander-Arnold takes over in the centre circle. Hits the ball forward. Salah trying to get round the back. Mitchell's header goes in towards the penalty area. Anderson again is there to volley the ball away. He hasn't missed a trick and his header goes behind for a corner kick. Eight minutes remain. Palace still holding on. And it's going to be Curtis Jones who's going to be coming off for Harvey Elliott. If Liverpool, who've got a habit of scoring late... They're going to leave it very, very late. As they still trail to that Eber Eche as a goal in the 14th minute here. So Bosley hands on hips, waits in front of the cop. Crystal Palace looking for their first win since early November. Out swinging corner, Van Dijk climbs, gets something on it. Henderson can't get there. Van Dijk tries to stab it forward, Mateta. Hammers the ball away inside the six-yard area, and referee Chris Kavner has noticed a foul. Free kick to Crystal Palace. High fives from Lerma and Henderson. Palace I I still defending. I don't know what the foul was for, though, but Henderson's gone fishing, and he's he's getting nowhere. The ball bounces off Van Dijk's head really high, and Henderson comes to punch it. Can't get there. I don't see what the foul is for. It's just a 50-50 in the box, but, again, very frustrating for Liverpool. Great for Palace. They can just slow things down, get a breather, take the sting out of things. And the body language, you know, they're going to keep going, Liverpool. How long's left, Ian? What do you make it? Seven minutes remaining Seven minutes normal plus. time. There will be... At least five? I'd say so, yeah. Liverpool have used up all their subs, and what Palace have used up three or four, so you'd imagine with him slowing the game down, Henderson as well, the ref's going out on a bit of time, so what you're looking at, maybe 12 minutes to win it. First time in top division history that three teams have had 70 points after 31 games. The title race could be going from three to two with Liverpool losing. Jota's diagonal forward ball, Salah, Lerma holds him off. Lerma tumbles, gets a foot into the challenge to force Salah away from goal, holds off Mitchell. Salah does well, plays the ball back. McAllister keeps it with Liverpool. Midway through the Palace half, though, now, towards Robertson. Six minutes remain of normal time here on Five Live and Five Live Sport. Munoz with a tackle on Sabosli. Free kick to Liverpool, about eight yards in from the left touchline. Lerma did brilliantly again. The foot race was Salah. You know, he's, he's running on fumes at the minute, Lerma, but he stayed with him dogged to the end and you've got to give Palace an enormous amount of credit they've defended heroically at times when they've needed to and they've done it with one recognised centre half so far can't fault them Anderson Lerma have been uh, outstanding in defence Robertson with this free kick on that far side the left attacking the cop Robertson left footed Comes in, Munoz heads the ball away Elliot has a little glance over his shoulder right hand side of the penalty area Ball swung in by Alexander-Arnold. Lerma there again to head it away, repelled by the Colombian. 
you sense as well, judging by the atmosphere, that there is a feeling of resignation from the Liverpool supporters here with just over five minutes remaining. A goal might change all of that. Oh, you couldn't release Mateta. So boss lie, that was risky. Tried a, a back pass, almost cut out by an outstretched leg of Mateta. Alisson now plays it forward. Five minutes remain of normal time. Crystal Palace still lead Liverpool by a goal to nil. What a boost this will be ahead of our next commentary for Arsenal against Aston Villa at 4.30. As Crystal Palace now with Mateta, 10 yards inside the Liverpool half. He falls to the ground far too easily. Gakpo gets away from the outstretched leg of Wharton, comes on the inside, now hits a diagonal ball. Elliot looks to control it, plays the ball in, takes a deflection into the penalty area. Ward with a clearance. No chances there from Joel Ward. Liverpool want a quick throw, but there's two balls on the pitch. Neil Lennon. Yeah, the fans are wanting Jada to get a cross ward and attack that ball. Uh, Elliot did well, dug out a great cross, but Jada just didn't go and attack it and awarded an easy clearance. Mateta, who's led that line very, very well, so often on his own, is going to be coming off. Edward is going to be coming on for Crystal Palace. Haven't had the best of records against Liverpool of late, but Gakpo round the back, checks back into the penalty area with a cross towards the far post. Elliot saved by the leg, the, heart, the hands of Henderson. Liverpool still pressing. Alexander Arnold on the half volley into the penalty area. Cross comes in, Jota climbs, Anderson off his chest, has the composure to then clear it away right footed. Four minutes remain. Palace still lead by a goal to nil. What a win this would be for Crystal Palace. Brilliant in the first half, resilient in the second. Elliot. Now towards Van Dijk. Van Dijk in the centre circle. Sir Boss Lai midway through the Crystal Palace half. Now with McAllister. Van Dijk to Canate. Oliver Glasner hopping, feeling every pass at the moment, trying that his side will still keep them at bay. Passing the ball in short triangles, Liverpool at the moment, without really going anywhere. Three minutes remain of normal time. Ideally, they need two goals. In this title race, as Elliot on the right-hand side passes the ball back into the centre circle, the captain Van Dijk facing only his second defeat in the Premier League at home in 98 games. Canate, central position. Van Dijk gets it again. So Bosley provides the width on the far side. Robertson is on the edge of the area. Liverpool still playing in front of Crystal Palace. Two and a half minutes remain. Alexander-Arnold forward, crosses on the run. Tucked in was Ward to head the ball away. Headed by McAllister back towards Van Dijk. Glasner applauds the effort of his Crystal Palace players. Elliot now. Liverpool still looking. Van Dijk now towards McAllister. Rolled out towards the boss line. Ten yards in from the left touch line. Just on the edge of the shadows of the cop. Crosses the ball. Alexander-Arnold off his chest. Hammers it into the penalty area. Blocked by Lerma. Mitchell couldn't get there. Lerma then again to clear the ball away. Palace will push out. Alisson's actually inside the Palace half. Yeah. It's just one more traffic as you'd expect now. Can they get the breakthrough here? Alex can Palace hold on? I mean, it's been a riveting watch. You know, Palace still deserve to lose it, but Liverpool don't... Del- or, yeah, lose the lead, but Liverpool don't... Del- deserve to lose the game for me Ian, because they've created enough chances to get something out of it here is Van Dijk quickly helps it on its way Gakpo runs in off the left touch line cross blocked by Munoz behind for another corner kick under two minutes of normal time remain live on BBC Radio 5 live and BBC Sounds Liverpool nil Crystal Palace won Liverpool remember started the day third they would finish it in third but the game in hand would they had not taken advantage, would remain two points behind City. In comes the corner kick, Anderson again attacks it, heads it away, Sir Bosley on the stretch, out towards McAllister, feeding it out towards the left, down it goes towards our Elliot, can't keep in play. Liverpool, for all their pressure, don't look like scoring. But they have done. You know, what we have to remember is, you think of the Nunes chance, you think of the Jota chance, they're clear cut, the, the Curtis Jones one on one, they're clear cut chances, they haven't taken them. So there is this sort of uh, misnomer that, you know, they don't, they're not going to score, but they have had the chances, that's the point that a coach would make. However, you've you got to take them, you know, and they haven't done that, and they've forced the game second half, and they've, they've really had a good goal, but you've got to give. Palace, huge amount of credit. They were brilliant first half on the counter attack, and they've defended like heroes in the second, in the second half. And it just shows you, and when it comes to, there's no easy games in this Premier League. No, no, a Crystal Palace side uh, who winless actually 
in the last five games since Glasner won his opening game against Burnley. Edward has come on for Mateta as the ball back from Robertson taken high on the chest by Allison, and we are now about to find out how much stoppage time there will be because by my watch the 90 minutes of normal time are all but up and Liverpool still trail by a goal to nil. The next instalment of the title race will be at the Emirates, Arsenal, Aston Villa at 4.30. Seven minutes have added on time, which we're now into. Seven minutes of stoppage time here at Anfield. It offers, albeit late, but renewed hope for the optimistic Liverpool supporters inside Anfield. Elliot. Alexander-Arnold combines with Elliot on the right-hand side. Elliot with the cross, redeveloped with the header away. Alexander-Arnold to McAllister, goes square. Saboslai passes the ball to Gakpo, left corner of the area. Gakpo delivers the cross in, off the chest of Jota. Salah is there! And what a run that was by Mitchell. It tracked him every way. And the left wing-back pops up on the far side to run another goal-bound effort wide. It's incredible, he's two yards out, he, it looks all the world a goal, and Mitchell comes from nowhere and blocks it. Unbelievable. Cross comes in from the corner kick. Heroic defending by Crystal Palace this afternoon. You think that they prevented three certain goals. Mitchell, the one from Klein, earlier on as well. And then the Henderson one from the legs of, uh, of Nunez. We welcome listeners to the BBC World Service. Here we are at Anfield in the closing stages. We're in the first minute, or in fact just entered the second minute, of the minimum of seven here at Anfield, where Crystal Palace are still leading Liverpool by a goal to nil. A goal from Eberichi Eze in the 14th minute of the game. And Liverpool's title challenge is seriously faltering. Elliot. Back it goes. Liverpool camped inside the Palace half, but Palace have defended manfully throughout this second half. Van Dijk waits, passes the ball towards Alexander-Arnold, rolls it out towards Elliot. Elliot swings over the cross, blacked by Aryu, cleared then by Wharton. Aryu now has to go it alone, the Ghanaian, runs forward, short of the halfway line, has no options, passes the ball back to Riedebelt. Van Dijk steps forward, prevents it from reaching Schlupp, forward ball, here is Mo Salah, Salah waits for the ball to settle, goes down inside the penalty area, Jota forced out wide, left-hand side, they've doubled up on Jota, and Munoz will be there for Crystal Palace. And they get a throw, Liverpool, down by the corner flag over on that far side, and five minutes remain. Still they trail. From the throw, Saboslai, Konate, 30 yards out from goal. Salah, Mitchell, tracking him every step of the way, tight as ever. Edouard tries to put pressure on McAllister. He got a knock in the back, McAllister's gone down, winded in the kidney area there as Van Dijk passes the ball out towards Gakpo. Gakpo on the left, enters the edge of the penalty here on that left-hand side, delivers the cross, Salah's touch goes away from him, out of the box. Alexander-Arnold plays a flat ball in, Lerma... Terrific defending again. Ian Anderson haven't missed a trick. So impressive. Yeah, he's been great. You know, considering he's a centre midfield player, he's read the game brilliantly. He's always been there. So is his big partner Anderson, and they've been a wall today. Even though they have been breached a few times, the goal is still intact at the minute. Ian. Here is Elliot. Four minutes now remain. Palace still lead by a goal to nil. Title slipping away, or the title hope slipping away here at Anfield for Liverpool. Elliot now edge of the area. Elliot onto his left foot, delivers the cross over the head of everybody. Did it take a deflection? Liverpool players thought so. Referee Chris Kavanagh says not. Goal kick, Liverpool nil. Palace won. 93 and a half minutes played. Lerma's gone down. I'm not surprised if he's got cramp. Yeah. <laughs> he's been everywhere today. He's given so much to his team. I know the fans are a little bit frustrated, but an injury's an injury, you know. And uh, he's been a uh, he's been a stalwart today. I think he's been brilliant for Palace. As is Young Wharton in midfield. I think he's had a great game as well. In this environment against the quality of opposition, I think he stood out for me as well. Judging by the bottom tier of that Sir Kenny Dalglish stand, the amount of Liverpool supporters heading for the exits, they don't believe. They don't have faith that their Liverpool side will score in the next three minutes that remain of injury time. As Palace, who've only kept two clean sheets in their last 23, are going to get a clean sheet here today, and you would think five points clear of the relegation zone before today. Never seriously felt that they'd get relegated anyway, but that would be enough for Crystal Palace this season as they look forward to a 12th successive season in the top flight, their longest ever run in the top division of English football. 
and two and a half minutes remain and Liverpool still trail by a goal to nil they've got it all to do in, in Europe in midweek we'll have that commentary for you on Thursday this could be a serious setback for their title though Salah back it goes McAllister finds Elliott cross charge down Mitchell to a man Crystal Palace players have been absolutely brilliant in yeah, every well, aspect. Yeah, I have to say, you know, Munoz, Mitchell, Lerma, Anderson, playing when he was on, the back five have been outstanding. Uh, I thought Hughes and uh, Wharton in the first half were brilliant, and, you know, we talked about Eze and Elise and what they bring to the team. You know, they're just a different team when those two, two play together. Um, and they're a brilliant first half. They've had to be resolute second half. They've hung in there, they've rolled their luck a little bit. But it looks like they're going to come away with an unbelievable result here, Ian. Certainly does. They haven't beaten Liverpool in their last 13 meetings since Sam Allardyce and two goals from Christian Benteke seven years ago. After that, Liverpool went on a long and beaten run of 68 games here at, uh, at Anfield. But their undefeated run in the Premier League of 28 is going to be coming to an end. The Crystal Palace fans in that... Half of the Anfield road end towards the left as we look, are starting to celebrate. They know that they're going to get a valuable three points here under Oliver Glasner as Mitchell, with 60 seconds remaining, keeps the ball down in the corner flag. And Liverpool with back-to-back -back defeats as Ayu tries to win a corner. Now you can forget any idea of Liverpool winning this game. The question is, can they salvage a point, even though that, that probably won't be enough? As the ball is played back to Alisson. Jurgen Klopp is having a word with the assistant referee. Chris Kavner has... I think there's a little off the ball incident between Lerma and Salah. Lerma's been shown a yellow card as a result, and a free kick has been awarded to Liverpool. Lerma's shown a yellow card for that off the ball incident. So the ball will be brought up away over the halfway line, free kick, well, it's sort of the second third of the pitch. This Alex, is it. it is. This is it. It's a Hail Mary now for Liverpool. Can Palace see it out? Whether it's enough. Alisson is coming up from the back. I remember being at the Hawthorns when he scored a goal for, for Liverpool. But the seven minutes have added on time are all but over. In goes the free kick. Van Dijk gets his header on that. And eventually it's dealt with. So Bosley runs the ball out of play for a, a goal kick. And once again, the high fives from Anderson and Henderson at the back. And Crystal Palace have won. Liverpool have been beaten. And their long, unbeaten run in the Premier League at home of 28 games comes to a shuddering halt. And maybe so does their title aspirations. It's a serious setback. Crystal Palace outstanding in every aspect. Attacking and adventurous in the first half, resilient and stubborn in the second, and Liverpool have lost back-to-back -back games here at Anfield. Europe on Thursday, the Premier League today, and Crystal Palace held on. Liverpool nil, Crystal Palace won nil. Lennon. Well, what a game! That game gave us everything. Both teams give us everything. Uh, incredible result for Crystal Palace. Congratulations to them. There. First half performance was absolutely brilliant. Liverpool really tried to force the game second half, and to be fair, created four clear cut, and I mean clear cut chances to get them back into the game. But it wasn't to be, and it's a huge blow. It may be irreparable Ian, in terms of their title charge. You can't lose games at home at this stage of the season. And uh, what a horrible week it's been for Liverpool to draw in a defeat on Thursday and a defeat again today. They left everything out on the pitch. They just couldn't score, but they should have done with the opportunities that they had. But let's give an enormous amount of credit to Oliver Glasner and his team. There were some brilliant individual performances, and as you quite rightly said, they were so resolute in the second half. What a scoreline. Not many people would have seen this one coming as the Palace players go over to celebrate with their travelling support. It's finished here at Anfield. Liverpool nil, Crystal Palace won. Ian, Neil, fantastic work at Anfield today, but what a scoreline, and that really shakes up this three-pronged title race. So the table before Arsenal kick off at half-past four looks like this. Manchester City top, 73 points, 32 games played, and a goal difference of plus 44. Arsenal second, 71 points, two behind, with a game in hand. That's against Aston Villa at 4.30, and a goal difference of plus 51. Liverpool have now played 32, the same amount as Manchester City, 71 points, 
and they're 10 goals worse at this stage than Arsenal in the goal difference stage. Um, Neil Lennon, you've just said you can't lose games at home at this stage of the season. Six games left, Liverpool's next three all away from Anfield. They're in a massive hole now. Yeah, if you analyse the game in the cool of day, Fletch, they just didn't start the game well at all. The first half performance was poor, and it doesn't matter, you know, against quality opposition, and to be fair, Palace going forward in the first half were quality. They punished them. You know, Mateta could have made a 2-0, you know the, it's going to come in the second half and Liverpool force the issue, but they did miss some real easy chances, Fletch. You know, you can't, you can't miss those quality of chances and expect them in the game. There was four, Nunez, Salah, Jota um, and Jones, you know, and it just didn't seem to be Liverpool's day. But you can't start games and play a game in 45 minutes, you know, against Premier League opposition. Palace rode their luck at times, but they also... Had an unbelievable chance from from Mateta in the second half. Allison, it was a miracle save, Fletch. We, this game, honestly, today had everything. It was so dramatic. It was so tense. It was so exciting. You couldn't take your eyes off it. And I said, Ian, you just don't get easy rides in the Premier League, and that's been proven today again. Absolutely. We'll get to Crystal Palace in a second. What a building block this is, Dano, for Oliver Glasner. But let's just talk about Liverpool for now. I don't want to pile in with a torrent of statistics, but they are numbers that we spoke about before the game started. They've now gone eight clean sheets in all competitions, eight games in all competitions without a clean sheet, six at home at Anfield without a clean sheet. And today, 21 shots and they didn't convert any of them. There is a familiar theme in Liverpool performances right now. They concede goals, and it's taken them far too many attempts at the other end to score them. Well, I mean, the finishing has been an issue for uh, this season, not just in this game, not just last week against Manchester United. And the failure to keep a clean sheet today actually equals a club Premier League record of nine successive home games. So that's from 1996 and also 98 to 99. So that's an unwanted statistic. And also the fact that, you know, we were saying before that, you know, they've fallen behind in 18 games this season. That You're constantly chasing games. And yes, they might have clawed back 27 points from losing positions, but they're putting themselves under pressure time and time again. And had it not been for Andy Robertson in the first half and Alisson in the second, Crystal Palace's lead could have been, could have been far greater. Uh, so, Neil, with his experience, believes that Liverpool now out of the title race massive massive blow and as you said when we mentioned it in commentary the next home game the 5th of May against Tottenham they knew coming into this game their destiny was still in their own hands it's no longer the case and Manchester City with their proven record very very difficult now for Liverpool uh, one more Neil on Liverpool for you then Dano I'm going to come back to you on Crystal Palace um, I mean 2024 Neil started with Liverpool chasing a quadruple they've won the League Cup and now they face the prospect of nothing else if they miss out in the title race they need a miracle on, on Thursday night in Europe and they've gone out of the FA Cup. I mean, this season now is starting to fall apart at the seams for them. Yeah, it is. I just said it's been a horrible week for them. You know, the draw at Man U and then obviously the 3-0 defeat on Thursday night, which I don't think anyone saw coming and I don't think many people would have seen this. Look, Fletch, we, we said before the game, we were talking to Ned and we were talking to Julian, you know, all the guys were saying, you know, we feel sorry for Palace coming here today because you think Liverpool are going to get on the front foot and take the game and swamp all over Crystal Palace they did that second half they didn't do it in the first half they only played one half today to the capability that we know that they, they can reach I thought first half they were all over the place I thought the, the shape of the team particularly down the right hand side defensively was so open and they kept giving the ball away and turning over the ball in the centre midfield and they, they got punished once they could have got punished a couple of times but they didn't look like championship contenders today I have to say particularly in the first half when I saw City play yesterday, you know, they looked, you know, a machine. And Liverpool, second half, were great, couldn't score, deserved to score, but you, you got to play two halves at this stage of the season, and I felt they give too much away in that first half. Ian, Crystal Palace then, two defeats in seven now under Oliver Glasner. They've scored in six of the seven matches, they've been ahead in six of the seven matches. They're now eight points clear of Luton in the final relegation place so they can forget about that and in those seven games they played three of the top five Manchester City Liverpool and Tottenham I just want to pick out one player today because you you quite eloquently explained all the, the magnificent blocks and defensive situations they got themselves in Joachim Anderson was given the player of the match 14 clearances today and he just glued that whole defensive effort together for them 
Well, he did. I mean, he had Lerma in midfield to one side, and then he had essentially a right back, Nathaniel Klein, to his right hand side. Lerma was equally impressive for, for Crystal Palace, but Joachim Anderson is the only Crystal Palace player who started all 32 Premier League games for Palace this season, and he was so influential. And those blocks came in from, from Klein and Mitchell. Everybody contributed. The midfield of Wharton and Hughes, when Hughes was on the field, they, they were tireless. Off the ball, they worked. You, I actually think Crystal Palace, if you said to Oliver Glasner, what was the issue with your team today? He would probably say it was a near faultless performance from Crystal Palace. They were a threat in the first half on the counter-attack. They created a number of chances. And then second half, the way that they defended, they put their bodies on the line. They were alert throughout. They were disciplined. They were organised. And Anderson was extremely impressive. And they've now been in the northwest this season. They've won three and drawn two. They've beaten Absolutely. Burnley. They've won at Old Trafford. They've drawn at City and they've drawn at Everton. And here they are winning yeah. at Anfield. Very, very good yeah. performance by Palace. Yeah, astonishing, really was. And the way they hung on and, and galvanised themselves at the end to, to somehow get themselves over the line, so impressive. Neil, last one then, so they've got Thursday now, they've not got a great deal of time before they, they've got to travel off to Bergamo and face Atalanta, 3-0 down from the first leg. I mean, psychologically, as much as anything, this is going to be such a difficult couple of days for Jurgen Klopp and the players. Yeah, they've got to pick themselves up somehow. They've got to go to Atalanta and, and try and win the tie. It's as simple as that, Fletch. Can they overturn a 3-0 deficit you know they're creating the chances they've got, to, they've got to start putting the ball in the net and obviously keep it out at the other end it's going to be so difficult for them to you know turn that around and then obviously they've got a, an away game at the weekend it's just been such a difficult three or four days for Liverpool do you think he'll go stronger on Thursday he made yeah, six changes yeah, last Thursday he'll yeah, go stronger think, this week yeah he's got to go strong you, you, you got to go th you may as well just throw everything at it now after today you know I was thinking you know if the one today maybe just keep it week to week for the Premier League but now they sort of slip behind in the title race here I think they've just got to go for every competition now Fellas, wonderful work today, great commentary. Your team at Anfield, Ian Dennis and Neil Lennon on a day that could be pivotal in the title race for Liverpool. Beaten at home by Crystal Palace, Eberetje Esser's 14th minute goal, enough to give them three points at Anfield. Their first win against Liverpool for seven years. Liverpool remain two points behind Manchester City. Six games left for them and the next three all away from home. So it's finished at Anfield, it's finished at the London Stadium as well, and London bragging rights today, Sahel Sahi, are going back to Craven Cottage with Fulham. Yeah, very much so. Full time here, Darren West Ham, Neil Fulham, two. Two goals then from the game's outstanding player, Andreas Pereira, one in each half. Fulham, they've enjoyed playing West Ham this season. That's seven goals over the two games, none conceded, and six points. West Ham, they missed the chance to move up to sixth in the table as they now turn their attention to Europe as well and overturning the two-goal deficit against Bayer Leverkusen on Thursday. Full-time here, Darren. West Ham nil. It's very quiet around here at the London Stadium. West Ham nil, Fulham 2. So uh, earlier today, first semi-final in the Women's FA Cup, Tottenham needed extra time to get past Leicester City. Leicester were ahead for the vast majority of that match. There was late drama, then the extra time, but Tottenham are there winning that semi-final on their own pitch. At the moment, uh, Sani Rudravadula, I'm looking at this, and Manchester United about 20 minutes away from joining them. Yeah, just under that at the moment. Yeah, United looking to return to Wembley where he lost to Chelsea, of course, last season in the FA Cup. They are winning 2-1 at the moment. Goals from Lucia Garcia in the first minute and Rachel Williams, 23 minutes in, have gained her a two-goal lead, almost approaching injury time of the first half until Lauren James pulled one back, the ex-Manchester United player, side-footing home to make it very interesting indeed. Chelsea in the second half have continued to press, as you'd imagine, from the team who were trying to get back into this game and they are putting United under a lot of pressure at the moment. Both managers have rang in the changes now but as it stands Manchester United are returning to Wembley they have 16 17 minutes left it's Manchester United 2 Chelsea 1 so Tottenham Hotspur uh, waiting for the winners in the final of the Women's FA Cup. Let's update the Champions Cup rugby taking place. This is at the quarter-final stage to lose an Exeter, Adam Whitty. And Exeter have this second just retaken the lead. To lose 17, Exeter 19. It's a gripping first period. We've just got underway in the second. The French side appeared to have taken the lead, taken control with a Jack Willis try, but Exeter have been fabulous and lead again by two points. 44 minutes gone in the south of France. It is to lose 17, Exeter 19. A place in the semis up for grabs. 
Thank you, Adam. I'm Darren Fletcher. This is Five Live Premier League Sunday. Commentary of Arsenal versus Aston Villa in the Premier League coming up at 4.30. Can it match the drama at Anfield that we've just listened to? Let's get the latest BBC News with James Wickham. Listen on BBC Sounds. This is BBC Radio Five Live. Israel's war cabinet minister says it will exact a price for Iran's attack on the country last night when the timing is right. Benny Gantz's comments come after Tehran fired more than 300 drones at Israel overnight. Jerusalem says 99% of them were shot down. Here, the Prime Minister has confirmed that RAF jets were involved in the action to defend Israel alongside the US, Jordan and France. Rishi Sunak has also called for calm. If this attack had been successful, the fallout for regional stability would be hard to overstate. And we stand by the security of Israel and the wider region, which is, of course, important for our security here at home too. And what we now need is for calm heads to prevail. We'll be working with our allies to de-escalate the situation. Well, G7 leaders are holding urgent talks this afternoon over fears of a further escalation. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres says he's deeply alarmed and condemned the attack. A number of Western powers have restated their support for Israel. Our international editor Jeremy Bowen says the situation may suit the country's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Don't forget, a few days ago, people were talking about the rifts between Washington and the Israeli government, and now... Everyone's acting in concert and it's looking like they're friends again. And more than that, the subject has been changed internationally away from the crisis in Gaza, the humanitarian catastrophe, the vast numbers of civilian casualties. Instead, we're talking about an attack on Israel. From Netanyahu's point of view, these are pluses. Well, the attack was in response to a strike on an Iranian consulate in Syria. Iran says it warned its neighbours 72 hours in advance that it would be carrying out retaliatory strikes on Israel. Sayed Mohammed Morandi is a professor at Tehran University. It was very humbling for the Israeli regime and it was a boost for the people of Gaza. From here on, we have a new equation. Whenever the Israelis go after Iranians, the Iranians will hit them harder. Well, we'll have updates through the afternoon here on Five Live and a new special with Johnny Ianson at 7.30. In other news, more than 250 survivors of the Manchester Arena bombing seven years ago are taking legal action against MI5. 22 people were killed by a suicide bomber at the end of an Ariana Grande concert. An inquiry concluded that the bombing might have been prevented if intelligence had been properly shared. And the Home Office says 214 migrants were intercepted while crossing the Channel yesterday. The number of people making the journey on small boats is up 17% so far this year, compared with the same period in 2023. Europe's elite club competition, the Champions League. Wednesday night at 8, it's the Champions League double bill. On BBC Radio 5 Live. Manchester City versus Real Madrid. over on 5 Sports Extra. Bayern Munich versus Arsenal. The margins are very small in this competition and that's the biggest lesson. The Champions League. On 5 Live. And on 5 Sports Extra. Listen on BBC Sounds. This is 5 Live Sports with Darren Fletcher. On 5 Live. Listen on BBC Sounds. So what an afternoon so far. Big upsets in the title race, both north and south of the border. Earlier, Rangers were beaten 3-2 by Ross County in the Scottish Premiership. And then, in the Premier League, a massive slip-up for Liverpool at Anfield, beaten 1-0 by Crystal Palace. Can Arsenal capitalise? Arsenal versus Aston Villa is the second commentary of the day here on Five Live at 4.30. Let's take you straight to the Emirates and join our commentary team. Chris Wise has the team news. Hello, Darren. Well, obviously, great interest at the moment in this Arsenal team, particularly as this game is sandwiched between those two Champions League quarter-final matches against Bayern Munich. What would Mikel Arteta do? Well, he's made three changes today. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Zinchenko is in at left-back for Kivior. But a bit more interest further up the pitch because Jorginho and Martinelli drop to the bench and in come Jesus and Trossard. Very hard, it feels, at the moment for Mikel Arteta to leave out Leandro Trossard because of the impact that he is having 
when he comes off the bench. So Arsenal in full, David Raya in goal, White, Saliba, Gabriel and Zinchenko in the back four. There were some doubts over Gabriel's participation, but he is fit. The midfield three, Rice, Erdegaard and Havertz, who drops back from that number nine role. And the forward line, Trossard and Saka with Jesus, we think, leading the line. Though, of course, it could be Trossard and Jesus off the left, so we will see. For Aston Villa, two changes from Thursday night against Lille. We already knew there was going to be no Douglas Luiz because of suspension. That's a big blow for Unai Emery. And also dropping out Leon Bailey as well. So in come Diaby and Zaniolo for Villa in two changes. Martinez in goal. Konza, Diego Carlos, Torres and Dinia the back four. Tielemans and McGinn in midfield. Then Diaby, Rogers, Zaniolo... And Ollie Watkins, two goals behind Erling Haaland in that golden boot race, up top for the visitors. Thank you, Chris. Let's say good afternoon to the former Wales international, Danny Gabbard, on for the first time today. Danny, welcome to the programme. How are you? I'm very good, Darren. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. So, look, let's start with this Arsenal team. I mean, he's pretty much starting with the side that he turned to in a crisis on Tuesday against Bayern Munich. No real surprise, because Jesus, Trossard... And um, who else has come in? Remind me of the other one, the third one. Um, all made a big impact yeah. off the bench, didn't they, the other night? When you think about the changes, Zinchenko, of course, yeah. came on at half-time. They turned it for them in midweek, so no real surprise he's done that. No, and I think, you know, it's important to kind of rotate as well. Uh, you know, the games are coming thick and fast for, for Arsenal, the likes of Liverpool, Man City, and uh, they do have a, an excellent squad of players. So, you know, we saw midweek players kind of coming on and affecting the game in a positive way. We've heard Chris there talk about Leandro Trossard. Very difficult to kind of leave him out at the minute, Fletch, because he's uh, he's been excellent for Arsenal all season, impacting the game from the bench or or if he starts. So uh, no surprise to see two or three changes, but you know the spine of the team is kind of still there as well. You know Saliba, Gabriel, which you know that partnership has been magnificent for Arsenal this season. Declan Rice has been sensational. You know he tends to always play and his performance levels never drop. And obviously the older guards in there as well. So um, you know the spine of the team still very much the same um, but he's able to rotate Mikel Arteta as well particularly in those kind of wide areas and it's it's, it's almost kind of light for light quality almost now with uh, the squad he's kind of building so we're uh, still a strong Arsenal start on 11. Have a quick look at Aston Villa in a second because there's no Douglas Luiz for them but what will the mindset of the Arsenal players be going into today do you think I mean they saw Manchester City win convincingly yesterday but they would have expected that but they might feel surprised as they come out for the warm-up now knowing that Liverpool have lost today yeah added incentive added incentive to really kind of you know stick the knife into Liverpool um, having seen that's kind of surprising defeat they would have expected Liverpool to, to bounce back from what we saw in midweek in Europe that wasn't the case so it's added incentive for this Arsenal team now to go out there and win and look they'll be concentrating on themselves you know they're well aware of what teams are doing around them but it's all about Arsenal and what they do you know it was this kind of period last season where the, the, they went off the rails and their, their season kind of stumbled so they'll be added determination I think you know this period again this season to uh, to right the wrongs of last season not make kind of the same mistakes and I don't get that feeling from this kind of Arsenal team this season they look different obviously with the additions they've kind of made to the squad how well balanced this team is now you know it's title winning form from Arsenal at the minute 11 games unbeaten they've won 10 of them drawn one scored 38 goals and conceded just four it's, it's incredible form it really is um, they, they just don't look like dropping points they're just swatting teams aside at the minute so uh look it's going to be a difficult one for this afternoon this Aston Villa team you know they've been magnificent themselves this season maybe stuttering a little bit of late um, but they know they'll have to be on the top of their game Arsenal to to pick up the three points this afternoon and I'm sure they will be it's going to be interesting obviously the focus the energy of Villa um, the energy of Arsenal as well after both teams kind of playing midweek but with Arsenal having two days extra rest over Aston Villa I think that's a big factor going into the, today's game as well so the kickoff in about 12 minutes' time. Danny Gabbard on alongside Chris Wise. Let's hear from the Arsenal manager, Mikel Arteta. He's thinking about being the first manager to bring the title to North London for 20 years. I don't think like this, to be fair. I think about what we have to do next, um, to be the next opponent and to be in, maintain the position that we are in. The, the job that we live and the game finishes and 15 minutes later we finish Luton and I was watching Brighton in my office in the stadium. And it's like this because you don't have time, you have to prepare and, and you are on to the next one. To look at one day and one game is the only thing that is possible. 
because it's the only thing that maintains your focus and determining the task that you have to do on the day, which is the only thing that you can control. Looking back to Tuesday, that result, because it was such a great game, but has that got the potential to be so draining for your players because what they put into it, or do you have to look at it the other way and they could take so much out of that for the end of the season? I think a lot to take, and especially how we manage emotionally the game. We've been very dominant and, and ahead, and in 15 minutes uh, you are behind a top side and, and you have to deal with that game emotionally, which is really tough to do, and I think the team did brilliantly um, to manage that situation, half time everything to play for in Munich. You, when you talk about that emotional, you, you can't teach that, can you, really? Can you as a manager, or do they just have to learn that on the field in big games, how they, how they take that into the last seven yeah. matches you've got? I think that's something that you have to work on daily with a lot of aspects, so when you are there, you already are leaving certain things um, in your system and as a team to be able to deal with them. So that's Mikel Arteta. We were chatting about this earlier in the programme today, about the mindset of the Arsenal team at this stage of the season, based on what they experienced a year ago when Manchester City went charging past them after they'd seemingly got the title in their grasp at, at one point. As they get nearer to the finish line, uh, Danny, are, are they going to? How are they going to be feeling? Do you think? Do you think they're going to be mentally stronger? Do you think there might be any leftovers from last year around certain brains right now? <laughs> um, well, look, Mikel Arteta will be hoping that they're mentally stronger. Um, sometimes I think when you kind of go through that adversity, the disappointment of last season, it does help to kind of build character. Um, look, at this stage of the season, of course, there's kind of pressure. They know how good this Man City team are. They'll probably feel that you know they have to win every single game between now and the end of the season. But you know that is possible from this kind of Arsenal team. But I just I think it's just about you know I'm sure there'll be thoughts about kind of last season. I'm sure they'll be having meetings. The players will be talking. The manager will be talking and saying, look, let's not let's make sure that we just focus on ourselves. You know, last season is kind of done. You know, we have to take it kind of game by game um, and just make sure that we're really focused and we're. We're performing to the best of our ability every kind of single game. So I think that's going to be what's required. This Man City team, you know, they've been there, done it, worn the T-shirt. You know, they're, they're so good in these kind of situations. And Arsenal are kind of still learning, really. You know, this squad is gaining experience kind of all the time. Um, but look, they're in fantastic form in a minute. And it's just about keeping that kind of consistency, um, you know, keeping the crowd behind them. And I think we saw kind of midweek when Bayern Munich kind of went in front and the, the crowd kind of changed a little bit here at the Emirates. And there was a little bit of tension and nerve in the air. And maybe that kind of fed into the players a little bit. It's, it's about the players just kind of keeping the focus, keeping their emotions in check um, and just believing in the quality that they have. You know, they're... They've done some brilliant work kind of up until this point, and, and this is the business end of the season now where it really matters and results really matter. So um, I, I think this is a different Arsenal team this season. I think they've learned a lot from last season. As I said, with the additions they brought in, Havertz was in great form, Declan Rice has been superb all season. I just think the, those two players are kind of have added to, to what Arsenal already had, um, and I, I think this could be the, the year, Fletch, I really do. Yes, yeah, fascinating. If they win today, they go back to the top of the table. Liverpool have already lost. Manchester City did their bit yesterday. Their opponents today, Aston Villa, uh, still have their eyes firmly on a top four finish. They are fourth right now. They went back in there when Tottenham were blown away at Newcastle yesterday. And their captain, John McGinn, feeling confident that his side can get that Champions League place. Yeah, well, it's one that's probably too complicated for us as players to focus on at the minute. Mm. Uh, we want to get in the top four. The manager said that he would review his ambitions after game week 32, so we're now on number 33, I believe. We, we, we can do it, we can get that top four position, we know we can. Um, it's obviously been a, an up and down few weeks in terms of league form, but we've put in so much in, into this season to, to then try and fall short and rely on other teams, rely on European results. We want to make this club a, a Champions League club again. Um, Tottenham are a top team, they proved that at Villa Park, Man United are obviously still behind us so it's not going to be easy but what an achievement it would be for us, we're only six games away from possibly making that happen so Tottenham will be the exact same, they'll be desperate for, desperate for it to happen and we need to make sure that we just do whatever we can to get there. 
Yeah, John McGinn says six games left. They are ahead of quite a few in the Premier League in terms of this is their 33rd game of the season. They've been good away from home, Danny, as well this season. Only the top three, Manchester City, Arsenal and Liverpool, have won more away games in the Premier League than Aston Villa. And, of course, the manager today, Unai Emery, returning to the Emirates, will need no further incentive, will he? Oh, he certainly won't. And, as you say, it's been a magnificent season from Aston Villa up until this point, Fletch. And I don't think anybody thought they'd be sitting... In fourth position, um, in a very strong position, kind of come start of the season when we were trying to think who might finish in those kind of top four places. But the job Unai Emery has done has, has been superb. You know, the form of late hasn't been that good. You know, not, not where you, the way you want it to be, probably at the business end of the season. But take nothing away from what they've done up until this point. You can look back to the great result against Arsenal early in the season at Villa Park with that John McGinn goal. So they'll take a lot of confidence from that. And as you said, Unai Emery coming back to Arsenal where didn't have the, the greatest of times he'll have a point to prove as well so uh, look they're a team that are very good away from home as well as you say you know with the attacking players that they have they're very good on the counter attack they're capable of causing Arsenal a lot of problems this afternoon but they're going to have to do a lot of things right you know they're going to have to defend really well as well you know the way Arsenal kind of control possession they're going to have to be really solid we look at their last away performance at, um, up at the Etihad there where you know they ret rotated a few players and they caused Man City a few problems on the counter attack when they were able to but they weren't able to kind of contain them defensively so um, they're going to have to get a lot of things right this afternoon defend well and then when they get the opportunities to kind of counter attack and create chances they're obviously going to have to take them but um, yeah little mini season for Aston Villa now can they get themselves going again finish strong obviously big game in Europe after this one as well so um, it's, it's been a magnificent season from them up until now players are in the tunnel about to make their way out that's been a good day if you're an away team in the Premier League Crystal Palace winning at Anfield Fulham winning at West Ham let's see whether Aston Villa can make it a treble or whether Arsenal can go back to the top of the table before we uh, join the commentary team at the Emirates let's just update the closing stages of the Women's FA Cup semi-final Manchester United Chelsea Sani Rudravadula well 90 minutes have elapsed it's Manchester United 2 Chelsea 1 there will be 8 added on but as it stands the goals by uh, by uh, Garcia and Williams will do it after James pulled one back it's Manchester United 2 Chelsea 1 8 minutes of edge of time to go to lose Exeter Chiefs in the Champions Cup quarter-final, Adam Whitty. Four tries in 12 dizzying minutes have seen Toulouse take control of this quarter-final. Two tries from Kinghorn, one each from Peter Arley and uh, Antoine Dupont. They push the champions clear. 45-19, they lead 57 minutes gone. So the players are out at the Emirates and this is the opportunity for Arsenal to go back to the top of the Premier League table. Or can Aston Villa solidify their place in fourth and start to turn that Champions League dream into more of a reality. Big one this, Liverpool have been beaten already today. What's the latest twist in this fascinating title race? Your commentary team at the Emirates, the former Wales international, Danny Gabadon, is alongside Chris White. Darren, thank you very much. Welcome everybody to North London under grey skies, but on a mild Sunday afternoon, second against fourth in the Premier League. And I think it is fair to say that most Arsenal fans would have expected to begin the day in third in the Premier League table. Regardless, though, they know that a win today will take them back to the top of the Premier League, above Manchester City, and back to where they began this weekend, at the summit, in pole position, and knowing that if they win all their Premier League games between now and the end of the season, then they will be Premier League champions for the first time in 20 years. Packed inside this stadium, really difficult to get a ticket to Arsenal games at the moment, understandably so, because right now Mikel Arteta's team are playing fast, fluent, fabulous football, and how do Aston Villa stop them today? A Villa team that have only won one in their last five in the Premier League and are looking a little wobbly right at a time where they need to stiffen up if they are to finish in the top four. Let's have a look at the two teams with all tracksuit tops now off, Arsenal and Aston Villa players having conversations, having hugs, ready to go on the pitch below us. For Arsenal, three changes from the game against Bayern Munich here on Tuesday night that they drew 2-2, but of course were behind in. Zinchenko, Trossard and Jesus come in. Kivior, Jorginho and Martinelli all drop to the bench. So Raya in goal, White, Saliba, Gabriel and Zinchenko. And then Rice in a midfield three with Erdegaard 
and Kai Havertz, who of course more recently has been playing as that number nine for Arsenal. Trossard and Saka, either side of Gabriel Jesus, who is reinstated to the Gunners team, looking for his first goal since January. For Villa, it's two changes from Thursday against Lille. Sharp turnaround for Unai Emery's team, as it always is with these Thursday and Sunday nights. In come Diaby and Zaniolo. There's no Douglas Luiz because of suspension. Bailey goes to the bench. Martinez in goal. Conza, Carlos, Torres and Dina in their back four. Tielemans and McGinn in midfield. Diaby, Rogers, Zaniolo and Ollie Watkins, their leading scorer by a distance up top as we hear the sounds of the Emirates ahead of kick-off here at half-past four. Danny Gavidon with every single game that moves on between now and the end of this Premier League season. As we have seen at Anfield today, it's unpredictable, it's fascinating and it is so watchable. It certainly is. The Premier League, the best league in the world ultra competitive you just don't know what's going to happen from game to game and i think we're in for another treat this afternoon here incentive for both teams this afternoon arsenal obviously with liverpool losing aston villa with tottenham losing yesterday i think we're going to be in for an absolute treat again so away we go then at arsenal's emirates stadium arsenal against aston villa here on five live and on bbc sounds and we've had the players taking the knee for the No Room for Racism campaign this weekend. And away we go with Aston Villa going from right to left in this first half in their chain strip of the blue, kicking towards the north bank, and Arsenal left to right towards the clock end, and already Villa with a couple of early throws on this near left-hand side, which Lucas Digne is going to take the second of, just rolling that white ball around in his hands at the moment with Villa sending Diego Carlos, their centre-half, up into the penalty area. As Dina's throw is long, it's intended for him, it's off an Arsenal head, then away by Zinchenko, hit by McGinn, it's come off an Arsenal player, it's looped back towards goal and over the top of the crossbar, and behind for a goal kick from that effort from Ollie Watkins, but Villa on the front foot and Leandro Trossard wearing the impact of McGinn's shot, which was fizzed towards him. Yeah, that's a half chance for Ollie Watkins on that far post as well. Not really dealing with that long throw into the box. Arsenal's flicked on, I think, by Saliba. McGinn on the edge of the box. Let's fly with a strike. Cannons off Leandro Trossard and just loops up to Watkins. And he's just looking to loop a header over David Rea. Just gets a little bit too much on it. Just clears the top of the crossbar, but the positive start for Aston Villa. Does look a little dazed, Leandro Trossard, as he runs up to take his position on the left side of Arsenal's front three. So as it is at the moment, Gabriel Jesus is the one that is playing through the middle for them. And play back underway with Arsenal in possession on this near right side with White, ten yards inside his own half, clipping one down the right wing for Saka to chase. Dinia taking no chances, putting it out of play. Arsenal throw deep inside Villa's half on the right as we welcome listeners from the BBC World Service. We're two minutes in here at Arsenal's Emirates Stadium. Arsenal against Aston Villa, the last of these instalments on a, another weekend of title games that mean so much to Arsenal, to Liverpool, beaten today by Crystal Palace, and of course to Manchester City, who at the moment are at the top of the tree after their emphatic win yesterday against Luton. Erdegaard, Jesus, now Saka in the box, back with Jesus, stopped by McGinn, who didn't want to dive into the challenge because he had to really allow Ben White to get to the ball. White did, but it's come off his boots and gone behind for an Aston Villa goal kick, 0-0. Yeah, lovely football from Arsenal. A set of play by Jesus, ball into his feet, he's got runners off him, Saka gets the other side of Luca Dina. And in the end, it's White coming round on the overlap. He looks like he expects a challenge to come in and he's trying to maybe play it off an Aston Villa player for a corner, but that actually wasn't the case. But interesting to see how high that Aston Villa defensive line is this, this afternoon. Yeah, it's, it's been, been one of the talking yeah, points, hasn't it? It's been very effective season. for most of the season, caught a lot of teams offside with it, but uh, interesting to see how brave they are at the Emirates. Interesting to hear the boos that have been directed at the former Gunners goalkeeper, Emi Martinez, every time he's had a couple of early touches here. Here is Diaby on the far right-hand side. Zinchenko has stopped him, but not stopped the ball going out of play, so it's going to be an Aston Villa throw. Yeah, big job for Yui Tillemans and... John McGinn in that central midfield area for Villa as well. You see the absence of Douglas Luiz. 
been a key key performer for them in that midfield area this season Budaka Hammer as well who's obviously got that long term injury so big job on for them to in there dealing with those those Arsenal threats Villa have made a bit of a mess of that throw Conso was the one taking it he wanted to retrieve it again but the pass back to him was wayward so suddenly it's an Arsenal throw halfway inside Villa's half on the left with Zinchenko with the ball in his hand, one of the real leaders of this Arsenal dressing room, Alexander Zinchenko. But Villa pinch it back once more, they've got it with Watkins, five yards inside Arsenal's half, he's sent it over the top, out comes Raya out of his penalty area. Neat touch, just dragged it away from Diaby, like a calm and collected central midfielder, David Raya there. Very, very good, that. Thought he was just going to clear his lines, clear that into the crowd, but fantastic composure, showing a great starting position as well, because Diaby's in behind and... Uh, I don't think Gabriel was going to catch him there, but excellent goalkeeping. Free kick for Arsenal. Saka pushed in the back by Luca Dina on the halfway line. Five minutes in, no goals. Of course, the other thread to this game, and there are so many this afternoon, is that Unai Emery is back here at the Emirates Stadium, had those 18 months in charge of Arsenal, the replacement for Arsene Wenger. Not the answer, though, for Arsenal. Finished fifth in his one full season in charge, but never really felt or he certainly will never really feel that he was given a proper crack at the job and it is not easy shoes to fill when you're coming in for Wenger here come Arsenal Erdogan into the box Saka right of centre across goal stopped well by that Villa defence it was Pau Torres who got himself there and Villa now play their way out and do it very neatly as well because they've got it towards Saniolo on the left who has run forward into Arsenal's half and then the challenge with Gabriel Jesus, fouled by Zaniolo. It is going to be a free kick to Arsenal. Nil-nil here, let's find out what's happened in the second of the women's FA Cup semi-finals because that's the interesting one, isn't it? Manchester United and Chelsea, how's it finished, Sani Rajavacula? And it's finished, Manchester United 2, Chelsea 1. United beating the team that beat them in the FA Cup final last season. They'll have another chance to win that trophy. Goals from Garcia on the first minute and a header from Rachel Williams on 23 are enough, despite Lauren James pulling one back in the second half. Chelsea pushed and pushed but couldn't get enough. It finishes Manchester United 2, Chelsea 1. Thank you, Sani. That is a terrific result for Mark Skinner's side. So they will face Tottenham Hotspur in that FA Cup final. Spurs beating Leicester earlier today by two goals to one after extra time and getting to their first ever women's FA Cup final in the process. Here, nil-nil between Arsenal and Villa. And Villa playing out from the back between the centre-half Torres and the goalkeeper Martinez. And then it's shifted up to the midfield where the backtracking Trossard has fouled Ollie Watkins, he feels that it was nothing more than a shoulder push, it was actually Morgan Rogers who went tumbling and it is a, a Villa free kick just inside the centre circle, no goals so far Danny Gabidon. Yeah, it didn't quite get the press right there, Arsenal from the goal kick, that was very easy for Aston Villa to kind of play out and play through the middle got the ball into Rogers in a pocket of space Oh, poor pass by Torres on the halfway line, Arsenal taking off him, Erdegaard threading it through to the right for Saka, it's just stifled the momentum a little bit of Arsenal's attack, but not for long, Saka towards the back post, Kai Havertz leapt, did he leap high enough though, because it looked close to him, it's over his head, it's out of play on the opposite side for a Villa throw. Yeah, the cross just looked like it was a little bit too high for him, Villa giving the ball away and they break quickly, Arsenal, Saka down this right hand side, Inside the 18-yard box, up against Pau Torres, drags it onto his right foot. He's got two options on the far post. Havertz is one of them. Oh, actually looks like he... Maybe he's not expecting the ball to come to him. There's a Villa play in front of him. He also looks like he, he ducks away from the cross a little bit. So Villa with the throw on the far right-hand side to us. They're going from right to left in the first half, halfway inside their own half as... The physical battle between Gabriel and Watkins is won by Gabriel and off on that left-hand side go Arsenal again. Good challenge, though, by Diego Carlos sliding in at the feet of Gabriel Jesus. And then a lovely change of direction from McGinn in midfield, who's drifted a pass up with his left foot towards Watkins, five yards outside Arsenal's box, and not down towards Saniolo. Good defending from Ben White, though, to cover the ground, and he nudges it out of play for a Villa throw. Yeah, I think it was a Saliba actually just eating up the ground. Ben White, which has caught up field. It's a really fast break from Aston Villa. Good ball in behind from McGinn, finding Watkins, who's nods the ball out wide, but Saliba kind of gets across and just uses that pace to, to get to the ball first and just mop things up. Good defending. One of the Unai Emery signings, William Saliba, though he never actually played for Arsenal until three years later. 
So no goals so far between Arsenal and Aston Villa, and uh, Arsenal have been given a free kick here for a push inside their penalty area. Let's head off to the rugby, shall we? Because there is a, a big game, a Champions Cup quarter-final taking place. Stad Toulouse against Exeter Chief. What is the latest, Adam Whitty? Uh, Toulouse have put the 50 up, cruising into the last four. Toulouse 51, Exeter 26. Juan Cruz Mali, the latest to dot down. Cruel on Exeter, but Toulouse sensational. They lead the Chiefs 52-26 with 12 minutes left. Wins yesterday for Harlequins, for Leinster and for Northampton Saints as well in their quarter-final games. 6.06 tonight from half past six with Chris and Robbie and of course we will be to the Masters from eight o'clock at Augusta National tonight with Mark Chapman and the team for the final day of what will be a really intriguing few hours in Georgia. No goals so far between Arsenal and Villa, no real chances either as Trossard collects the ball, holding off Villa's defenders in the process. Back in field for Declan Rice who just puts his foot on the ball and assesses the situation, the former West Ham player. And back out to the left-hand side for Trossard. Infield for Zinchenko. And now on the halfway line, it is Saliba. Saliba for Erdegaard. And back with Ben White again, just inside his own half. Ten minutes played, Arsenal nil, Aston Villa nil. Yeah, just looking at the shape of Aston Villa. And they are going with that high defensive line. Not a lot of space in between that back four and that midfield of McGinn and Tillemans just trying to nullify the spaces for Havertz and Odegaard to work in Remember it finished 1-0 to Aston Villa when these two met earlier in the season and a goal that by this stage of the game had already been scored by John McGinn as well, Arsenal on the front foot here lovely ball, Havertz, great save Martinez plunging down to his left hand side, Havertz probably about five yards away from him when he took aim inside the box and that is the first significant save of the game and it's come from the uh, former Arsenal goalkeeper Emi Martinez yeah decent save good reaction save Havertz making that late dart in behind left hand side of the 18 yard box he gets fed in the weight on the pass is really good so he can take the strike on first time hits the target decent save just runs in behind McGinn I think it's Carlos who's desperately trying to get across not able to. Yeah, good reaction save from Martinez. Spent 11 years with uh, Arsenal Emi Martinez, so we'll certainly know a few of these players. Zaniolo has misplaced his pass from the halfway line, the Italian. <laughs> Needed to go forward, really, for Moussa Diaby. It was behind him. And it's out for an Arsenal throw on the halfway line on the far left-hand side here in North London. 0-0, Arsenal and Aston Villa. Remember, earlier today in our... Other five live Premier League commentary, Liverpool nil, Crystal Palace won. What a scoreline at Anfield. What a twist in the title race. What an opportunity for Arsenal to try and make this three-horse race a two-horse title race. Yeah, and I have to say Crystal Palace were magnificent. First half, they could have been two or three up. Second half was a different type of performance from them. They had to defend really well. Kim Anderson were absolutely outstanding, marshalling that Crystal Palace backline and I thought they deserved the win in the end. Joachim yeah. Anderson, who for my money, Danny, outside of the, the, the big clubs in the Premier League, is one of the best centre-half defenders in the league. It's very, very good, yeah. How do Aston Villa crack this Arsenal team today? An Arsenal team who have not been behind in any Premier League game since a trip to West London on New Year's Eve when Fulham beat them at Craven Cottage. On the back foot again here with Zinchenko, but they don't have Saka as part of this attack, he's still down injured on the halfway line, Zinchenko on the overlap's got it back, dinked up towards the far post, that's exactly where Saka should have been, Odegaard has come over to collect it instead, Zaniolo's taken it away from him, Zaniolo's clearance has only gone as far as Saliba, who is 50 yards from goal, Saka back on his feet now, but still walking a little gingerly, Zinchenko is assessing whether he needs to put the ball out or not, as he collects it on the left, Saka is OK, he is coming forward again to be part of this Arsenal attack, and Arsenal are willing to wait for him, Gabriel, 20 yards outside Villa's penalty area. Here's Declan Rice just popping it into the feet of Zinchenko, then wide with his left boot from Zinchenko to Trossard, who comes back in field for the Arsenal centre-half, Gabriel. They're quite high at the moment, aren't they, this Arsenal defence? We saw it against Bayern Munich here on Tuesday night as well, and they were caught out. Well, they were, but, you know, you look at Man City as well, that's how they like to play, it's how a lot of teams are kind of going now, Jesus, I think, just caught offside here. It's about controlling possession these days and trying to pen teams in and just kind of exert that pressure. 
I don't think I would enjoy a centre-back being that high up the pitch in that kind of midfield area, but the game was very different when I played. Just wondering whether... A, I'm not sure whether the referee just produced a yellow card there. He might have done. It was two an Aston Villa player. There was certainly a cluster of Villa players around him. We'll try and get confirmation of that in a moment. 14 minutes in, no goals between Arsenal and Aston Villa. Which seems a bit weird, really, because between them this season they've scored 192 goals in all competitions, Arsenal and Aston Villa. They certainly haven't shortchanged anybody. Here's uh, Tielemans for Villa, who, remember, are without Douglas Luiz today, suspended after collecting 10 yellow cards himself. Confirmation of that. That flash of yellow that I saw, it was towards Morgan Rogers. so that's yeah. the first caution yeah, of the game. Yeah, I think that was for the challenge on the Kyle Saka. I think the ref just obviously let play go, and then just bringing it back once the, uh, the attack comes to nothing. Long ball forward, looking for Diaby, cut out by Gabriel, but awkwardly it's come off his head, and it's, rather than gone forwards, bounced to the side of Arsenal's penalty area, and Diaby's gone on to it, Dinia's come up to join him, he got the ball, Dinia, but he was blocked by Saka, who now looks fit and fresh again as he swipes that ball away for Arsenal and all the way back into Villa's half where Emi Martinez in the all green with the very bright yellow gloves collects it and gives it to Pau Torres the Spanish centre half who has not scored a goal for Aston Villa since November when he got one against Tottenham Hotspur so will he continue that North London loving today here's Diego Carlos his centre back partner back with Pau Torres again left hand side just moving slowly into Arsenal's half, then trying to clip it forward for Zaniolo. It was wayward of him, quite straightforward for Arsenal's defence to deal with. And uh, Saliba looks controlled as he and Rice and then Erdegaard settle everything down for the Gunners. Yeah, really good composure again, shown by Saliba. The crowd just making him away. <laughs> he was under a bit of pressure there, but didn't panic. Zinchenko over the top, no flag against Havertz at the moment. It's Kai Havertz for Arsenal, and Havertz is eventually denied. He would have been denied anyway, because the flag has gone up for offside against him. Villa managed to get players back. The two centre-halves, Diego Carlos and Pau Torres, were close to Havertz. Martinez saved it in the end. It's quite tight. It's tight, but it is off. Good defensive line held by Villa. Havertz just goes slightly early, but he's just looking to... Make those runs off John McGinn. I think he's the man who's trying to kind of track those runs in behind and gets caught the wrong side there. McGinn, thankfully, just goes early, Havertz. Senior across, it was missed by Saliba, but there for Arsenal is Zinchenko on the edge of his box before Watkins or Diaby can make anything more of it for Aston Villa. And uh, back goes Saliba to Raya. He sweeps it out to the far left-hand side for Trossard, but all of this at the moment still halfway inside Arsenal's half. Zinchenko then settles the Gunners down with a pass to Rice, who gives it to Jesus on the halfway line. Back with Declan Rice again, who is cantering forward here for Arsenal. Now Erdegaard, five yards outside Villa's box, to the right-hand side for Saka, onto his left foot, far post, Jesus side netting with his head. Could have gone back across goal, went for goal himself, Gabriel Jesus. And that is not a problem for Emi Martinez. Yeah, probably should have gone back across goal. Jesus, the angle was tight for him, but excellent football from Arsenal. And again, worked the ball up the field really quickly, left to right. Saka with that delivery into the far post. He is under a bit of pressure from concert. Maybe just does enough to put him off, and he's trying to beat Martinez on his near post. Doesn't quite get it right has scored for both Arsenal and for Manchester City against Aston Villa in the past, Gabriel Jesus. In fact, he scored for Manchester City in a 6-1 win at Villa Park back in 2020. But goals for Arsenal, at least in recent weeks, have not been forthcoming for Gabriel Jesus. That was an opportunity. Villa with a throw here, five yards inside Arsenal's half on the left, 18 minutes in, no goals between Arsenal and Aston Villa on five live. We're on BBC Sounds, where you can... Listen to every single national and local radio. And indeed, we're on BBC World Service as well as Luca Dinia sends it back into his own half and it is picked up by Pau Torres with those orange and green boots and into the back line for Diego Carlos, who is five yards further back behind him with the white wristband wrapped around his left wrist. And back with Emi Martinez, his goalkeeper. Will Villa be relatively pleased with how they've contained Arsenal so far, Danny Gabidon? Yeah, I think it's almost 20 minutes gone and 
And they're still nil-nil. Arsenal have had some moments. They've played some good football and cut Aston Villa open, but not really any clear-cut chances as of yet. So, uh, so far, so good from a Villa perspective. Only a win for Arsenal will take them back to the top of the Premier League table. If they don't win here, the weekend will end with Manchester City at the summit. White for Rice for Arsenal. Now Erdegaard, 20 yards outside Villa's box. It is just right of centre as... Erdegaard collects it again, he's picked a peach of a pass into the box for Saka and he's hit the side netting as well, the opposite side netting to Gabriel Jesus from two minutes ago but what about the pass from Martin Erdegaard? Yeah, sensational from Erdegaard, he's got the vision but the execution to go with it he just goes to sleep, Luca Dini on his left hand side, Saka makes a run off the back of him, gets in behind him and it's Pau Torres who gets across and just makes that Strike on goal from Saka, a little bit more difficult. He's not able to hit the target in the end. Won't surprise you to learn that Martin, Martin Erdegaard has... Well, hold on to that thought, Arsenal have got it back again. Erdegaard has slipped, though, on the byline as he was trying to cross. He was falling backwards in doing so. And Villa now will get the chance to play out, and they've done it well, out towards Saniolo. And the centre-half wasn't sure whether to come or not there. Saliba and Villa have worked this really well. They've got it to Watkins, who's on the edge of the box. Watkins now into the penalty area, stumbled slightly. Arsenal getting bodies back there. Watkins has it again for Villa. Now with Morgan Rodgers. Rodgers on his left foot. That's repelled as well. Tielemans picks it back up for Villa once more. 20 minutes in, nil-nil, but a little more positive from Aston Villa. As they slow things down, Arsenal with all 11 behind the ball at the moment. Villa in possession. And they're 25 yards outside of Arsenal's penalty area as the noise from the home crowd goes up a notch again here just to encourage their team, just to ensure that there are no slips. I'm sure they will be having flashbacks to last season, particularly after watching Liverpool lose earlier to Crystal Palace. It will feel all so very familiar to Arsenal fans. And quite possibly. That was a good opportunity for Ollie Watkins. Just took too long in possession. Ball on the left with Dinia. Low crossing, Zinchenko should get there, stretches out a left boot, wins it, then has it taken off him by Diaby. This is McGinn, Erdegaard's got it back though for Arsenal. Only one pass on, it's a forward one for Gabriel Jesus. I'm racing over to cover the ground there first, Diego Carlos, the Villa centre-half, and they have it back again just inside their own half, Aston Villa. Yeah, the game just getting stretched there. Last couple of minutes, good counter-attack from Aston Villa where they had good options. Zanian Willow picking out Watkins, he's 1v1 against Gabriel, he's just looking to hold him up. He's not sure whether to get a strike away or maybe pass, and then that allows Trossard to get back and pick his pocket. Watkins and Rogers trying to play a 1-2, but the two didn't quite happen because the ball didn't come back to Morgan Rogers. And Arsenal move forward with Erdegaard, pulls himself away from John McGinn, who had a grab at his shirt, and then from the halfway line with his left boot, knows that Trossard's in space on the left, and he carries it forward for Arsenal, now on the periphery of the Villa penalty area. Great defending from Moussa Diaby, went shoulder to shoulder with the other number 19, Leandro Trossard, got the ball back, and then Trossard has committed a foul eventually on Diego Carlos. Yeah, good defensive work from Diaby. Recovery runs from Aston Villa, really good there, because a potential Arsenal counter-attack was on. That's going to be important for Aston Villa, it's happening how quickly they kind of get back into shape. They don't want the game to be open and stretched, because that will suit this Arsenal team, but the RB doing really well to get back in and just help his, uh, his full-back there. Only one win in their last five, Aston Villa in the Premier League. They were five points clear of Spurs just over a month ago. On the same points coming into this afternoon's game, but of course because Tottenham were beaten 4-0 at Newcastle yesterday, the goal difference took such a hammering that Aston Villa moved above Spurs in the table without playing and back into the top four. Zinchenko lifting it forward, out comes Martinez. Did really well. Knew his situation, got there before Havertz. Keeps getting in, no. Keeps getting in, Havertz. Oh, just... then Zinchenko from distance, but it wasn't a problem for Villa. That was from almost a halfway line from Zinchenko, but even though Martinez was out of position, there were a couple of Villa players back on the line anyway. Oh, it's a poor kick from Martinez, straight to Zinchenko, and he tries to send it back. On the volley, Pau Torres on the cover. Havertz keeps making that run in behind, he's just running off the back of McGinn and he's letting him go. He's got him on a couple of occasions, a couple of times the ball's just been a little bit too heavy, but... Former Premier League defender and Welsh international Danny Gavidon with us here on Five Live for Arsenal against Aston Villa on this Sunday afternoon. 
as Declan Rice gets it for Arsenal, halfway inside Villa's half, gives it to Erdegaard, drags his foot over the ball, pulls it onto his left boot, then moves and drops the shoulder and goes back the opposite way towards the right-hand side where White has laid it off for Saka. Back in field for Erdegaard, just a couple of yards outside Villa's penalty area. White into the box, Gabriel Jesus with the smart turn and the shot that was blocked before it got to Martinez. Back to the edge of the penalty area for Declan Rice. Arsenal are just beginning to put their foot down on the accelerator Yeah, now. what a block from McGinn, though. It's a really good block. Great skill from Jesus inside the 18-yard box, just turns inside Pau Torres, and he's looking to get a strike away on that left foot. Unai Emery is right on the edge of his technical area, the Aston Villa manager desperately trying to get some instructions onto his players as Gabriel picks up the ball for Arsenal. Nil-nil here, Arsenal against Aston Villa on five live. Trossard on the far left-hand side. Back in field for Zinchenko. Here is Rice, Havertz, dropping off again into that little pocket of space. Now Erdegaard, who can, as we know, make things happen and make things happen from nothing for Arsenal. White and Saka combining. Back with Bakaya Saka. Erdegaard spins away from Villa's defence. Now stands up and faces goal. Saka to the byline, cross into the penalty area. Gabriel Jesus muscled out of it by Pau Torres. And the goal kick eventually off Erdegaard. Oh, no. In fact, the decision is Arsenal corner, and some of the Villa players disagree with that. Yeah, certainly look from here. Zaniolo played the ball off an Arsenal player and it out for the goal kick, but Wiseman obviously has a better view than us, so we'll take his word for it. So in front of the clock end then, an Arsenal corner from this right-hand side, 25 minutes passing on the big clock above the stands. And no goals so far between Arsenal in second and Aston Villa, who began the afternoon in fourth. Saka raises his right arm into the air and the corner towards the near post is headed away by Villa. Diaby picks it up, takes it on his chest. He's been harassed by Zinchenko, he's run into trouble. He's run into Saka and Arsenal have got it back again with Trossard. And now Zinchenko, reverse pass for Saka. It was wayward of him who could do all he could really just to try and stop it from going out for a goal kick, which he did, but he's relinquished possession to Aston Villa. And now they break again as Rodgers passes it out to this left-hand side for Diaby. Arteta is telling his players to get back here. Diaby, now Zaniolo, the two wingers at the moment, both on this left-hand side for Villa. And back in field for Yuri Tielemans, who looks around, gives it to Diego Carlos in the centre circle, in Arsenal's half. Now Konza is playing as a right-back again today for Aston Villa. In field for McGinn. Now Tielemans spinning the Belgian, scored two goals against England, didn't he, in that friendly last month at Wembley, Yuri Tielemans. And here is Pau Torres. Arsenal nil, Aston Villa nil, all over in the rugby in the Champions Cup quarter-final, Adam Whitty. Toulouse will face Harlequins in the semi-finals after crushing Exeter 64-26, nine tries from the French side, four in 12 early second half minutes decided things and uh, the five-time champions really romped home at the end. Full-time, Toulouse 64, Exeter 26. Thank you very much, Adam. No goals here between Arsenal and Aston Villa on five live, but Villa have had the ball for the last couple of minutes. Now they might be able to work something. Morgan Rogers on the edge of the box, went past one, couldn't get past Ben White, having initially breezed away from Saliba. Morgan Rogers, the young Villa attacker, and Arsenal collected again with Trossard on the far left-hand side, and they enjoyed that. The home crowd from Leandro Trossard, a back heel to Alexander Zinchenko inside his own half. Yeah, it was just a straight ball played into Morgan Rogers. He's able to turn the quick feet that go past Saliba, but Ben White did a good job on the cover, coming across on that right-back position and a really well-timed tackle. Look at Unai Emery down on the touchline, Danny. He, looks no, like he doesn't stop, does he? Looks <laughs> like he's at a rave down there. <laughs> Arms going absolutely everywhere on the touchline. His Villa players are fit. I imagine he's pretty fit as well, considering the energy he has to put into 90 minutes on the touchline. He's Dina, the former Everton defender. Now Morgan Rogers, who has had an impact in recent weeks for Villa, having joined from Middlesbrough in January. Out it goes to Diaby on the right, edge of the penalty area of Arsenal. Konza on the overlap. Cross was poor from Ezri Konza. Behind before it reached any Villa player goal kick. Yeah, centre-back's cross there, Chris. Can't really say too much. I've, <laughs> I've been there playing in that right-back position. You get into those kind of forward areas and it just doesn't quite feel natural for you. Good opportunity for Konza there. Just trying to hang one up to the far post. He's right on the, on the byline there. 
mind you, didn't he score against Wolves a couple of weeks ago from a very similar position as that, Esri Conzo? I don't know if he meant it or not, but one of those from the byline that he sort yeah. of looped up to the far post He'll take and dropped it. in. He'll take it. Yeah. That's what all the defenders say, don't they? <laughs> Danny Gavadon with us here on Five Live. And Arsenal, who have probably had the best chances so far, now might have the best one of the lot as Havertz runs through and Diego Carlos ran with him and the Villa defender got his boot on the ball. And even though Emi Martinez can't stop it from rolling behind for an Arsenal corner, that is excellent centre-half work from Diego Carlos. That keeps happening, Chris. That Havertz run off the back of McGinn in between full-back concert and Carlos. And it's only his pace that saves him. There's recovery pace, Carlos coming across. He just leans into Havertz, gets something on the ball. It's good defending in the end. But that can't continue to happen, that, that so, ball in behind, that run in behind. So you're saying positioning poor, pace good there. Well, for, somebody for needs Diego to pick Carlos. him up. Diego Carlos needs to see the run and get across quicker. Or McGinn needs to track the run. Europa League winner with Sevilla, Diego Carlos. And that team managed by Julian Lopetegui, former Wolves boss. Arsenal have still yet to take this corner and we are about to tick into the 30-minute mark in this game. A sacker from this right-hand side. Arsenal going from left to right in this first half in their red and white home shirt. And Saka left-footed, swinging it in to the edge of the six-yard box. Gabriel was close to it, but there were so many Villa players around him and everybody was so tight to one another that he couldn't generate any power on the header and it's a goal kick. It was more floated delivery from Saka into that far post area. I think it's concert, just grappling. Gabriel just stops him from heading the ball. Neither of the two players kind of head the ball in the end, and the ball just goes over the line for a goal kick. It's good work from, from concert. Doesn't win the ball, but just does enough to stop Gabriel attacking it. Well, 12 months ago today, Arsenal were six points clear of Manchester City at the top of the table. It's actually a year on Tuesday since Arsenal's 2-2 draw with West Ham, which you might remember because they were 2-0 up, relinquished a two-goal lead, having squandered a two-goal lead for the second game running, did so against Liverpool the week before. And then, of course, they drew here with Southampton, got smashed by Manchester City, and that really was their title challenge in tatters last season. But it does feel different for Arsenal this season as Pau Torres collects the ball inside his own box. Villa are playing a bit of a dangerous game here. Tielemans has got it out to that right-hand side for Konza. And in the end, with nothing really on for Diego Carlos, he's lifted it upfield to the halfway line where Arsenal have picked it up again with Gabriel. Yeah, and they will do that, Aston Villa. They will look to play out. They're brave in possession. They will take chances. You know, we saw them a few weeks back at West Ham doing something very similar and they struggled with playing out from the back in that kind of first half. Jesus scampering down the left-hand side to get to the ball ahead of John McGinn inside the final defensive third of Aston Villas. Havertz with the layoff on the edge of the box for Rice. Rice into the penalty area. Trossard on the angle. Diego Carlos close to him. Contact between the two of them. Trossard tumbled backwards, then thumps the ground in frustration that he didn't get the penalty from the referee. Arsenal have still got possession with Trossard. He's done well to get it to the edge of the box, where Jesus gives it to Erdegaard. Erdegaard tried to turn it back round the corner for Gabriel Jesus, and eventually for Villa, it's away and out of play from Diego Carlos. Yeah, he's been good so far. Diego Carlos just needs to be careful in those situations, though. Inside his own 18-yard box. Don't think it was a penalty. But Trossard's going nowhere there. He's got his back to goal. He's holding the ball up. He just needs to stand his ground there. Referee today, by the way, is David Coote as Villa come forward. And in these moments, they do look a threat to Arsenal. Tielemans, Tielemans sending it through, but sending it with too much pace for DRB. And at his feet, sprawling David Raya to collect it, the Arsenal keeper. Yeah, need to make more of those opportunities, Aston Villa. It's a lovely ball played into Tielemans. He just runs off the back of Declan Rice and he's just looking to feed DRB in behind, just overhits the through ball. Saka again picking up the ball, looking to run at Villa's defence, gives it to Odegaard, it deflects back to Saka and then tries to squeeze it through the gap for Jesus. Lots of nearly moments so far for Arsenal and indeed at times for Aston Villa as well where the final ball hasn't been quite right. But Odegaard pinching it back off Rodgers who has been left in a heap on the halfway line. Here's Havertz from the edge of the box, stopped by the legs of Diego Carlos. Back with Trossard, Trossard shoots, closed down by John McGinn who's made a couple of vital interceptions in the first half and then Diaby retrieves it for Villa. 
Yeah, done a good job, Villa, kind of getting bodies back quickly, getting back into shape. Just make it, make it difficult for Arsenal to find a way through, really, a shot on goal. And they have had the two or three moments when they've had good possession as well. They've been able to kind of cut through Arsenal and get into some good areas, but it's just been that kind of end product, it's been that kind of final pass that's been lacking so far. The Villa fans are singing in the corner of this stadium, the southeast corner of the Emirates Stadium, so on the opposite side to us. The Arsenal supporters respond in kind with vocal noise of their own. But the longer this game goes on at 0-0, the nervier Gunners fans will be, considering that Manchester City have got their job done this weekend. Liverpool did not. Here's Zaniolo, was having his shirt pulled by Ben White, who's probably going to get booked for that, but Villa has still got the ball. Diaby from the edge of the box, blocked by William Saliba, who turns his back on it and gets something on it, the defender. Good block. Zaniolo's been very good as well. He's been a really good outlet in terms of retaining the ball for Aston Villa and allowing them to spring on the counter-attack. I think he's just really hurt himself, Nicolo Zaniolo. He's tumbled off the ball here and he's rolling around in a lot of pain, but Arsenal are going to carry on with their attack and there's no reason for them really to stop. Zinchenko, Zaniolo's not back on his feet at the moment. Oli Watkins is asking Arsenal to put the ball out. And Zinchenko is going to oblige, and the Arsenal fans don't like that because they were in possession right outside the Villa penalty area. But clearly, clearly, Nicolo Zaniolo is in pain, and actually, some of the Villa players are going over to Alexander Zinchenko and personally thanking him, recognizing that Zaniolo is in trouble. Oh, very nice of Zinchenko there. I'm not sure if I would have done that. Ben White, rightly booked as well. Good referee in David Koo. Zaniolo getting his shirt dragged by Ben White and he allowed the attack to continue, which came to nothing. The shot from Diaby was, was blocked in the end, but uh, I'm not sure what Zaniolo does here. I think it might be his own man. Tillemans runs into his own man and... Possible poss clash of knees. Yeah, possible clash of knees there. His line on his back at the moment, the Italian, who has been treated by a couple of Aston Villa medical team members. He's been helped back to his feet, so I think he's OK, Saniolo, to carry on here. And while he is receiving the treatment, Mikel Arteta is taking the opportunity to gather all 11 of his Arsenal players around him down on the touchline to give some instructions to them. I can see him down there, the Arsenal manager, in all black, uh, gesticulating to individual members, hands moving all over the place, clapping them together. Clearly trying to come up with a plan to break this Aston Villa team down. 37 minutes in, Arsenal nil, Aston Villa nil. What might the message be from Mikel Arteta as he takes a big swig of water from one of those red Arsenal cups? Keep playing Kai Havertz in, I think, possibly, because <laughs> he looks the most dangerous player. He keeps making those runs. Off John McGinn, in behind that Aston Villa back line. He's got in once, he's been offside once. Diego Carlos has had to come across a couple of times with a couple of good bits of defending. Not a fan product, really, from either team, I would say. Both teams look threatening, Arsenal more so. Wasn't actually on the touchline, Mikel Arteta, when Arsenal lost at Villa Park in the reverse fixture back in December because he was serving a, a touchline ban. Here's Bukayo Saka for his team, though, on the right side of Villa's box. Declan Rice sweeping onto his right foot towards that far post. I wonder whether that was going to go into his own net there from Diego Carlos, who got his foot on it, and the ball sort of moved away from him, but also moved away from his own goal, which was good news for him. But Arsenal will come at Villa again on this right side with Saka. Now Erdegaard on the edge of the box. Erdegaard looking for some space. On to Zinchenko, further still to the left side, on the angle for Trossard. Trossard into the box, Erdegaard's shot. Closed down well by Pau Torres. Lots of Villa players getting themselves in the way at the right moments. As Arsenal continue to probe as Erdegaard flicks it round the corner. Havertz to the far post, looking for Saka, who won the header, but has sent the header over the bar. Beautiful to watch. In particular, Martin Erdegaard. Fantastic bit of skill. I'm not even sure how to describe what he does there. Ball's played into his feet and he just kind of rolls it around the corner. How he even knows Havertz is there, I don't know. And he just floats the ball to the far post. Saka wins the header up against Luca Dini on the far post, but 
just under enough pressure to not be able to kind of guide that header on target. Has a good friendship, doesn't he, with the uh, his Norwegian teammate Erling Haaland. I imagine those two are in regular conversations on WhatsApp. Oh, a mistake by Arsenal in their back line. The ball presented to Wally Watkins. Watkins in the box. Watkins has hit the post and he's come back across goal and bounced out the opposite side for a goal kick. Oh, what a chance for Aston Villa and Ollie Watkins, who is really unlucky, not working with much. Swept that shot low towards goal. Raya beaten, but saved by the paint. Well, his first real sighter at goal, Ollie Watkins, and he's so, so unlucky. It's Gabriel who plays the ball off the back of Zinchenko. Now Arsenal down the other end with Gabriel Jesus having got there. Reprieve. Erdegaard from the edge of the box, deflected, but it's come to Jesus, a cross goal, and Trossard stopped by Martinez, who has made one of the saves of the season with his feet. What an unbelievable stop from Emmy Martinez. Yeah, end to end stuff. Martinez, what a save. It's Erdegaard with a shot which cannons off a Villa player, and it comes to Jesus, and he squares it across the six yard box. Trossard, first time finish, what a reaction save. And Martinez with that right boot. He's got no right to save that. Just looking at the Ollie Watkins chance again. So, so unlucky. Hits the strike across David Raya. Comes off the inside of the post and somehow doesn't go in the other side. Misses that far post, goes out for a goal kick. So, so unlucky. Would have been his 26th goal in all competitions, Ollie Watkins. And then immediately down the other end. A world-class save from a World Cup winning goalkeeper, Emmy Martinez. And somehow, with the game now having really come to life with five minutes to go in the first half at the Emirates Stadium, it is still Arsenal nil, Aston Villa nil. Danny Gabidon. Yeah, Trossard, he thinks he's scored there, makes good connection. You know, he's right central area, six-yard box. He's thinking, I make good connection here, I score, but Martinez, fantastic reaction save. Arsenal with a bit of thrust in their attack. Saka for White. White cuts it back with his heel. He's got it to Saka on his left foot. Saka shoots and he shoots wide of the post. Nearly a carbon copy of the goal he scored here against Bayern Munich on Tuesday night. But that one not quite as precise from the England international. Yeah, Mikel Arteta much happier with what he's seen from this Arsenal team now. And that's not too far away from Saka. You see him score from that area on so many occasions, gets it onto that left foot. Low shot looking to find that far corner, inches away from that far post. Just rousing the crowd, Mikel Arteta. Doesn't really feel like they need rousing inside the Emirates Stadium today. Arsenal and Aston Villa, nil-nil, but going toe-to-toe -to -toe here on Five Live, on BBC Sounds and on the world service as well and remember if you are just joining us and you are unaware earlier today in our Premier League live game at Anfield it finished Liverpool nil Crystal Palace won so Liverpool still third in the Premier League table on 71 points the same as Arsenal who are above them in second with their superior goal difference and Manchester City at the top on 73 so an Arsenal win will take them back to the top Gabriel Jesus getting it off Torres on the halfway line off goes Trossard through the middle covering well Konza not particularly pretty initially from Villa but they got the bodies back there to deal with it only cleared away as far as Declan Rice though from Villa as uh, Tielemans retrieves it again for the visitors and then Carlos clips it upfield towards Zaniolo he traps it nicely with his left boot forced out towards this left hand side Nicolo Zaniolo with the Black strapping round his knees. He thinks he's got a free kick. He hasn't, but he has earned Villa a throw on the halfway line on the left. Yeah, his retention of the ball, Zaniolo, has been very good. He's been that kind of out ball for Aston Villa where they've been under pressure. They've looked to kind of get the ball into him, and he's been very good under pressure in tight areas. He's played some clever passes, did a good job there of just retaining the ball and winning a throw in for his team. It's only his second Premier League start in four months, Nicolo Zaniolo. He's on loan from... Galatasaray, but has obviously had a great career already, even at his tender age, with the likes of Inter Milan and Roma in Serie A, as McGinn with that trademark pass with his left boot, looking for Dinia, who had advanced on the left side, the Aston Villa fullback, but Saka was back there, defending him, and very composed, gives it to Rice, 
Rice spreads it to Zinchenko, and Arsenal suddenly come forward down the left-hand side with Trossard. Havertz is trying to get up there as well. Trossard is up against Konza. Now teed up for Zinchenko on the edge of the box. He's got it through the gap for Havertz, who sends it across goal, but nobody's on the end of it, and Luka Dinja touches it behind, but it won't be a corner, because the offside flag is up against Kai Havertz. Well, he's going to make him pay at some point. He keeps making that run again. Oh, I don't think he is. It's really tight. I think Luca Dean on this left-hand side might be playing him on. Maybe the Lionsman should just let that go and plays it across goal to nobody in the end. But uh, he keeps making that run off the back of McGinn. He keeps getting in. Last 60 seconds of the first half, plus stoppage time to play here at a packed Emirates Stadium with the white sloping roof above the stands and the white clock over to our right-hand side, high above the clock end, quarter past five, the time showing on it as Villa come towards the edge of Arsenal's box, Morgan Rogers has been caught and it is going to be a Villa free kick and it is probably about two yards outside Arsenal's penalty area. Well, he does a good job, Morgan Rogers, of just reading where the ball is going to drop down from that long kick forward. He picks up the second ball, gets there ahead of Declan Rice. And Gabriel just, as that right foot comes out, there's definitely contact there, I think. He's right on the edge of the 18-yard box, pleading his innocence, Gabriel. Now, whether Luca Dean is going to take this free kick or not, I'm not sure, but he, he was the one that was very deliberately past the ball while the referee was dealing with the Arsenal complaints off the back of that conversation and that free kick. And we move into two minutes of stoppage time at the end of this first half. But what a prime opportunity here for Aston Villa to strike a very sizeable blow on Arsenal just before half-time, a free kick which is right of centre a couple of yards, no more than that, outside the Arsenal penalty area. Yeah, and he does strike a good ball. Luca Dean it might be a... A little bit too close to maybe get it up and over the wall. Very difficult. It's only well, probably 18, 19 yards out. So he might maybe elect to go the side that David Raya is standing. It's one of three Aston Villa players over it. John McGinn is there as well, and so is Yuri Tielemans, who we know is a very decent dead ball specialist too. So in the final 60 seconds at nil-nil here between Arsenal and Aston Villa, a free kick for Unai Emery's team on his return to the Emirates Stadium just before half-time and just outside the Arsenal box as the referee, David Coote, puts his whistle to his mouth. dinia has got it up and he's got it into the Arsenal wall, but no further than that, it's away by Trossard upfield and the referee's whistle has actually gone for an Arsenal free kick and Villa will feel that is an opportunity wasted. Yeah, possible head injury to Gabriel, so the referee just uh, stopping play there, but it was always going to be difficult to get that up and over the wall, a little bit too close for Luca Dina. The wall did a good job, it jumps and does his job making the block. Well, indeed, Villa are suggesting that they were the ones in possession and they're pretty irritated that it's Arsenal that are going to be given possession back here from that drop ball, but that's the decision of referee David Coote. So the final seconds of the first half, Arsenal nil, Aston Villa nil. And Villa, who have hit the post to Ollie Watkins in this first half, but Arsenal, who have had several opportunities, the most notable one, the save from Martinez from Leandro Trossard, as Zinchenko rather wastefully sends a ragged pass forward, not to a teammate, but to Emi Martinez, the Aston Villa goalkeeper, and that, Danny, might be the last action of the first half. Yeah, quite possibly, but you can see that some of the Arsenal have worked on the last couple of days, Havertz kind of making that run in behind, because they hold that high line, Aston Villa, and... So there's a reluctance for Diego Carlos, obviously, to track Havertz, and he's just making that run from a deeper area off the back of McGinn, and that be something that Aston Villa needs to look at at half-time. It has been a threat. Might be one more chance for Villa here before the break, because they've just been given a free kick for a foul by Erdegaard, 20 yards inside Arsenal's half. He's barged Tielemans in the back. John McGinn is having his say with referee David Coote who is not interested, he's turned his back and is walking away to mark out the 10 yards that Martin Erdegaard is going to have to stand here. As we move into the fourth minute of stoppage time, of two that were indicated, but remember, that's a minimum. Villa free kick, McGinn with it, 
left-footed, swept up to that far post and coming onto it was Konza, who got to it, diverted it behind for a goal kick. And there is the half-time whistle. Arsenal nil, Aston Villa nil. Villa have hit the post through Ollie Watkins. Arsenal have made lots of moves inside the Villa penalty area, but only really have tested Emi Martinez with that opportunity from Leandro Trossard, though. He's certainly been kept active by those in front of him. The Villa defence a little wobbly at times, but from two teams, Danny Gabadon, that love goals, we don't have any so far here. No, we don't, and I think Unai Henry will be the happier of the two managers going in at half-time. He will have been well aware coming into this game how difficult it is to come to the Emirates, and at times they've been stretched defensively. They've had to defend really well, in particular Diego Carlos, who was outstanding in that first half, Marshall in that back line. Arsenal have had moments. Leandro Trossard chance probably being the best of the first half for them. But a post to nine, Ollie Watkins as well, did everything right. Great strike across David Ryan, comes off the inside of the post and somehow doesn't go in the other side. So you have to say Aston Villa on the whole, I think, will be the, the more happier of the two teams to go in half-time, still very much in the game and having one or two moments on the counter attack themselves in that first half. So uh, improvements to be made for Arsenal at half-time, but they have been knocking on the door. They have got into good areas, just hasn't been enough clear-cut chances up until now for them. Well, as it stands, and you're going to hear these words a lot in the weeks ahead, as it stands in the Premier League table, Arsenal remain in second, a point behind Manchester City. They have to win this game if they're to go back to the top of the Premier League table. But at the break here, at home to Villa, they are not. Arsenal nil, Aston Villa nil. So Manchester City's weekend as it stands after Liverpool's defeat, nil nil at half time. I mean, the only observation, Danny, I would have is that the longer it goes on like this, the greater the pressure will be on Arsenal and the more galvanised the Aston Villa players will be by the potential opportunity. Yeah, 100%, Fletch. The longer this game goes on at nil nil, you know, you can. The crowd, I'm sure, will start to get a little bit more nervous, a bit more anxious. We saw that a little bit in midweek with a buying game. And, uh, you know, you just hope that doesn't kind of then affect the players. But, uh, look, Arsenal will continue to believe in themselves, I'm sure, second half. They'll continue to play exactly the same way. You know, he has good options. Mikel Arteta, obviously, from the bench as well to try and affect the game. Um, and, of course, it will galvanise Aston Villa the longer they kind of stay in the game. I think they've shown moments threats on the counter-attack at times in that first half um, you know they'll continue to believe as well so um, <laughs> they'll want to they'll want to get a goal you know ideally you want to get a, an early goal in this game and it kind of settles everybody down and you're able to kind of control the game better that hasn't been the case for Arsenal but look, as I said they'll, they'll continue to play the same way they'll continue to knock on the door and they'll believe that they'll be able to find that opening flex second half so still very much to play for for but from both teams Absolutely, looking forward to it. Chris Wise and Danny Gavin on with the second half. Nil-nil at half-time between Arsenal and Aston Villa. The closest either team came, Ollie Watkins, who hit the inside of the Arsenal post. Loads to get through between now and the kick-off at the Emirates for the second half. First, we've got to get the latest news from James Wickham. Listen on BBC Sounds. This is BBC Radio 5 Live. The Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, has said he's formally condemned in the strongest terms Iran's attack on Israel in a call with Iran's foreign minister. Writing on X, formerly Twitter, he said he made it clear that Iran must stop these reckless attacks, de-escalate and release the MSC Ares, the commercial ship with links to Israel seized in the Strait of Hormuz on Saturday. Meanwhile, the White House says it doesn't want to see the crisis in the Middle East escalate after Iran carried out its first ever direct attack on Israel. John Kirby, a US security spokesman, said Washington was not seeking a wider war. The president and the prime minister had a good discussion largely about the extraordinary success of last night. Again, look, the president's been very clear. We don't seek a war with Iran. We don't seek an escalated tensions in the region. We don't seek a wider conflict. And everything he's been doing literally since the 7th of October has been designed to that outcome. The Biden administration has led calls for restraint in response to Iran's attack on Israel, in which hundreds of drones and missiles were launched. Israel says nearly all were shot down. Israel's war cabinet has been meeting to consider its next step. Iran has warned of a bigger response in the event of Israeli retaliation. Hanok Midwilski from the Israeli Prime Minister's Likud party says there is unanimity in the Israeli government that there should be a response. 
how and when exactly and what sort of response these things obviously uh, will not be talked uh, in public but i don't think that anybody in his right mind can expect israel not to retaliate after hundreds of uh, missiles were fired uh, at her direction this is a very crucial time uh, in the history of the state of israel we are fighting for our lives Iran says it gave its neighbors 72 hours notice that it would be carrying out strikes in retaliation for Israel's attack on its consulate in Syria. The Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has been taking part in a call with other G7 leaders this afternoon with the emphasis on resolving the situation diplomatically rather than militarily. Speaking to Laura Koonsberg on BBC One, the Cabinet Minister Victoria Atkins said the UK was working to ease tensions in the region. This was an incredibly significant attack on Israel uh, and the U United Kingdom, along with our international allies, are very, very focused on uh, de-escalating this. We do not want this to go further. We, know, we all understand how uh, difficult and sensitive it is in the region at the moment and so all of our diplomatic efforts uh, are in that vein. And we'll have a new special on Five Live from 7.30 this evening on events in the Middle East. In other news, more than 250 survivors of the Manchester Arena bombing in 2017 are taking legal action against MI5. 22 people died in the blast after an Ariana Grande concert and hundreds were injured. And a man who lost his sight three years ago has become the first blind person to complete a marathon without being tethered to another runner. Yaya Pandor finished the Manchester Marathon with the help of voice instructions from a nearby guide. The 28-year-old completed the course in four hours and 22 minutes. Europe's elite club competition. The Champions League. Wednesday night at 8. It's a Champions League double bill. On BBC Radio 5 Live. Manchester City versus Real Madrid. <laughs> over on five sports extra Bayern Munich versus Arsenal the margins are very small in this competition and that's the biggest lesson the Champions League on five live and on five sports extra listen on BBC sounds this is five live sports with Darren Fletcher on five live listen on BBC sounds so second half to come from the Emirates. Nil-nil between Arsenal and Aston Villa. Loads to get through between now and then. Liverpool's title race suffered a big blow today after losing 1-0 at home to Crystal Palace. I should say their title challenge rather than their title race. They're currently third. Two points off Manchester City. Here's Jurgen Klopp. We are very disappointed, especially about the first half. So I, I said we will show reaction. Um, I promised that. I mean, we, we saw a reaction. We saw a an influence of the last game we saw that so obviously we lacked conviction in the first half we were never really compact that's how it is and um, Crystal Palace deserved in the first half at the one elite and we couldn't turn it around in the second half so in terms of the the title race clearly no longer in your own hands how do you see it does that change your mindset your mentality for the final few games of the season it's easy to explain we play like in the first half why should we be there we play in the second half we can win football games if we can win football games and we have to see how many we have to be around when the others struggle if they struggle at all we will see that and if not we still have to need points for the champions League, all these kind of things so it's a we have to play better football. That's my concern. And that for 95 minutes or 100 minutes. Then it's OK. And then take what you get. It was always like that. But you should not play like we played in the first half. But it happened. I couldn't turn it around with the boys that get this Atlanta game out of, out of the system. Yeah, that disappoints me personally a lot. But now I cannot change that anymore. So that's Jurgen Klopp, but for Crystal Palace, the win takes them eight points clear of Luton in 18th with a game in hand. Oliver Glasner also spoke to Gary Flintoff. How good does it feel from a coaching sense in terms of the plan? You came here, you played your football, you played with your confidence, considering you are coming to Anfield and you are playing a team such as Liverpool. Well, it's always important uh, for me that we express ourselves we play who we are and what we are and and when we meet tomorrow it's always to say okay we did it our way and we tried our best and then we we can uh, uh, accept the result and of course it's much better when you you have three points in the pocket and you go home with uh, with a win here and uh, yeah first half was fantastic maybe the best half since we are here 
And Crystal Palace have done so well in the northwest of England this season. Is there something in the water in this part of the world that just works for you and your players? <laughs> I don't know. So it's, I just heard this that the, the, it's uh, more raining than in London or in northwest. So maybe yeah, it's, it's it's something in the rain. But today was good weather, uh, and so I don't know. For so if, yeah, if we need to go northwest, so I have to talk with with the chairman maybe to build a training ground here because then we can uh, can train uh, harder and, and get more um, better results. Oliver Glasner chatting to Gary Flintoff, his best win as the Crystal Palace manager. Eight o'clock tonight, don't forget coverage of the final round of the Masters. When we finish, 6.06, .06, Robbie Savage and Chris Sutton. Sav's here now. Uh, it's one of those days, Rob, that everything takes care of itself. I would think you're going to be swamped tonight. Oh, Fletch, yes, it was that game. <laughs> Liverpool, how many chances did they miss in the second half? Arsenal missing chances as well, Fletch. Could this be the best possible weekend for City? You know, we think City, Fletch, and you've you know you've been around long enough to think that City could win every game from now to the end of the season. Liverpool, what a bad couple of weeks, Fletch, going out against Liverpool in the FA Cup, Atalanta 3-0, you know, defeat, and now losing home to Palace. But Palace were brilliant, Fletch, in that first half, as Jurgen Klopp says, so... The title race, Fletch, this next 45 minutes, will it be a case that just give the title to City after this 45 <laughs> minutes if Arsenal don't score? I know, it's one of them. You know what was on my mind as well on Friday, and it's kind of been backed up a little bit again today? I just wonder whether the fact that the Liverpool players and everybody at the club and all the fans and everything know that Jurgen Klopp's off at the end of the season, whether a pressurised situation is now even more pressurised because they want to give him the perfect send-off, they want him to sign off in style you know should they have just kept it internal and then in the summer announced that he was leaving uh, is yeah, this affecting them now you know it's a big one Fletch isn't it looking because you look at Emma Hayes at, at Chelsea they've gone out of the FA Cup the treble's no longer on for them but they're still in the WSL and the Champions League race so it's, it's a great question fans our Liverpool fans will obviously ring up the show on that Manchester United reaching their first ever you know, FA Cup final, Fletch, they beat Chelsea 2-1. And a save from Mary Earps, Fletch. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, it's a James header. What an unbelievable save. If nobody's seen it, you know, I'm sure it'll be on the BBC website. Look at the save from from uh, Mary Earps from Lauren James. For me, the save of the season, Fletch. It Ooh, is unbelievable. Yeah, so United good. will take on Spurs, I think, Fletch, in the, in the, in the Women's FA Cup final. Yep. And Ross County. Um, Chris Oof. was in Scotland to see Ross County beating Rangers. Oh, wow, what, what a day, Fletcher. We're going to get loads of calls. Um, <laughs> uh, by the way, did on, on the Friday Night Social, did Clinton ever respond to me throwing him um, 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 through the table like a WWE wrestler? He's not been on since you said it, oh. but when he is on, I'm going to play it. So we, it, we, oh. it, it's still got, it's got to be concluded, this one. We might need yeah. you some kind of SummerSlam event sponsored by 606. <laughs> anyway, Tom, man, have a great one. Cheers, We're going to get back to the second half. Well done. Cheers, Sam and Chris Cheers, on the man. way later on. Uh, Sutty's going to be delighted with the fact that Rangers lost earlier today. Um, when they finish, 8 o'clock tonight, live in Augusta for the conclusion of this year's Masters. Uh, world number one, Scotty Scheffler, leading by one, going into the final round. Uh, correspondent Ian Carter joins us now. It's going to be brilliant tonight, Ian. I think it is. We had a sensational day yesterday, Fletch, no question about it. And that's 71 from Scotty Scheffler, capped with a superb birdie at the last, just nudging the favourite ahead at uh, seven under pole. We've not had a, a bookie's favourite win the Masters since 2005 in Tiger Woods. So he's trying to buck something of a trend here, Scotty Scheffler, but he is by a distance the best player in the world at the moment. That doesn't guarantee victory by any stretch of the imagination. Nation. You've got Colin Morikawa, a two-time major winner, out with him in the final pairing. They're going to tee off at uh, 7.35 your time, just one shot behind. Max Homer really impressed me yesterday, even though he didn't hold anything in his 73, five under two behind. And what a debut it's been for Ludwig Ober, this Swede playing his first major at four under par within three shots of the lead. And just looking so unflappable, he might be the biggest threat to Scheffler later on. Yeah, briefly before we head back to the Emirates, what about conditions today? Conducive to decent scoring? It looks that way. I think they have watered the greens a little bit, so the traditional pin positions are there. Tom Kim's out there. He's had six birdies already in his uh, 11, 12 holes so far. So there are opportunities, but if you push too hard, you could hit trouble.
Ian, looking forward to it. Ian Carter, part of our team later. Mark Chapman in the chair. The team live from 8 o'clock on 5 Live. Scotty Scheffler leads by one. Who's going to win the green jacket? You'll find out later on 5 Live. OK, massive 45 minutes on the cards at the Emirates. Not just for Arsenal, for Aston Villa as well. Liverpool have been beaten today. Pep Guardiola sat there with a glass of red after a lovely Sunday roast. Let's see what the Gunners do. Danny Gabidon, Chris Wise. There's a glass of Rioja, I think, waiting for somebody of these two managers, Mikel Arteta and Unai Emery, off the back of what happens here. Which way this game is going to go? Which way this title race is going to go? Who knows? There has not been a draw, by the way, in the last 16 Premier League meetings between these two teams. The last one, November 2012, it was nil-nil at Villa Park, as it is here at the Emirates Stadium. Arsenal get us underway to a roar from the home supporters at the start of this second half, going from right to left in the red and the white home shirts, the white shorts, the white socks, and Villa defending the goal to our left-hand side in their chain strip of the all-blue. And Danny Gabidon, it's inescapable, really, that there's this feeling that this is 45 minutes that is very, very big in Arsenal's season in particular. Oh, well, it is. Look, there's still games to go. There's still points to play for. But we know how good this Man City team are. And they get to this stage of the season and they, it's quite conceivable they could obviously win every single game that they have left so uh big big second half for arsenal the longer this game goes nil nil the atmosphere in the emirates will change and there will be that feeling of here we go again this happened last season so a uh, big 45 minutes for this arsenal team scooped out of play by declan rice who kicks thin air in a frustrated motion because he feels that perhaps he could have done more with that about this time of the season, really, as Villa prepared to take this throw, where everyone starts talking about players of the season, young player of the season, signing of the season. Declan Rice has got to be in that category, hasn't he? Yeah, he's been outstanding with every single penny. And Arsenal paid for him. His consistency, you know, he's never injured, really, as well. And his leadership skills, he really has added to this Arsenal team, he really has strength for that kind of midfield area. There's Torres for Villa. Sending one forward, Saliba has taken control of the situation. David Raya had come right to the edge of his penalty area, the Arsenal goalkeeper. Saliba said it's mine, and in the end, he's got Arsenal the throw. He's cleared it out of play off Luka Dina, but it's deep down inside Arsenal's half in that right-back area. So let me give you the two teams, then no changes at the break. Arsenal nil, Villa nil. For Arsenal, Raya in goal, White, Saliba, Gabriel Zinchenko, Rice, Erdegaard and Havertz in midfield, Saka, Trossard, and Jesus in their forward line. For Villa today, Martinez, former Arsenal goalkeeper, Konza, Diego Carlos, Torres and Dina, and then Tielemans and McGinn, Diaby, Rogers, Zaniolo, and Oli Watkins, Villa's leading scorer, who, remember, hit the post in the first half here as John McGinn brings it forward with those broad shoulders but runs into Arsenal traffic halfway inside the Arsenal half and now the Gunners come forward with Kai Havertz opening up his legs he's now halfway inside Villa's half and they're still not engaged and he's got it into the box for Jesus who's gone down a tangle of legs between him and Diego Carlos Jesus puts his hands to his head he's got his mouth agape but David Cooch shakes the head and says no penalty yeah and all that come from John McGinn just running into traffic losing the ball and it just set Arsenal off on the counter-attack Havertz driving towards that 8 yard box and he just feeds the ball into the runner, Jesus, and there's contact from Diego Carlos who comes across on the cover. Does like to have a little bite, Diego Carlos. I said it in the first half, needs to be careful inside that 18 yard box. I don't quite think there's enough contact for the to give a penalty. Of course, penalties were all the talk here after Tuesday night against Bayern Munich. The ones that weren't given anyway, some in the Arsenal camp felt that perhaps they could have had one right at the end of the game with Bakaya Saka. Pretty much all, I think, in the Bayern Munich dressing room were adamant that Gabriel should have been penalised for picking the ball up in his box when only one can presume he hadn't heard the referee's whistle. Thomas Tuchel, understandably, infuriated by that, and they do it all again on Wednesday night, and it will be live on Five Live. We'll have that game on Wednesday night. We'll have Manchester City against Real Madrid as well at the Etihad. That will be on Five Live. 
by Munich against Arsenal at the Allianz on Five Live Sports Extra. It's just a, a huge shame they're on the same night, really, because the entertainment last week between those four teams was magnificent. Four minutes into the second half, Arsenal midway inside Villa's half, working to the edge of the penalty area. Havertz takes it on, and he's clipped it up, and the ball has bounced up off the hands of Yuri Tielemans. It's outside the box, but it is an Arsenal free kick. Well, it probably is a free kick. There's not a lot you can do about it, though. You know, he's fired it at Tillemans hands, and he's standing right next to Kai Havertz, but does hit the hand, so no other option, really, for the referee, but to give the foul. Promising position here for Arsenal. Yeah, we had that Villa free kick, didn't we, right at the end of the first half, which they could not do anything with. It's at the same end. Arsenal attacking the north bank at the start of this second half. There are four Arsenal players clustered round the ball, which is five yards outside of Aston Villa's penalty area as they assemble their four-man wall. A couple of free-kick contenders have walked away from the situation now. And Declan Rice, who is leant forward with his hands on his thighs at the moment, gives a little slap on the back of Merton, Martin Erdegaard and says, it's all yours. So the Arsenal captain is the only one at the moment who is standing poised and organising a wall of his own here, Martin Erdegaard, of three Arsenal players who have positioned themselves in front of that four-man Arsenal wall. It doesn't really suit a left footer. But he's going to take it on, Martin Erdegaard, and he is a magician, and he's hit the wall on this occasion. No rabbits coming out of the hat on that occasion for the Arsenal midfielder. And Villa escape and bring it forward down this right-hand side with Diaby. Five and a half minutes into the second half, we are on five live on BBC Sounds on the BBC World Service network as well. And it is still Arsenal nil, Aston Villa nil, on a day where Arsenal began the game in second, Villa in fourth, but so tight for Arsenal in terms of trying to get that title for the first time in 20 years, and for Villa to get Champions League football for the first time since it's become the Champions League. They haven't been in it since the European Cup and those wonderful heydays of the early 80s. Yeah, it would be a magnificent achievement and the job that Miami has done this Aston Villa team really have been superb and they're in a fantastic position to do that Champions League football next season Villa Park be brilliant for the fans and Zaniel we're just doing a good job again there Villa playing out balls played in and shows good body strength he struggled to cope with him at times Ben White's done a good job of kind of retaining possession using his body to draw fouls mentioned in the first half that he's hardly been used by Unai Emery in recent months in starting roles, Nicolo Zaniolo. Here comes Moussa Diaby, one of the Villa players that's come into the team today. He's got it into the box, well left by Gabriel. Had the shout clearly from David Raya, lifted his leg up like a flamingo to leave the ball to run underneath it, and it goes through to the Arsenal keeper. Yeah, it's a poor pass in the end. Again, it's a promising position for Aston Villa as he drives inside Diaby, and he's just looking to play a pass into someone and continue his run, and he doesn't find the Villa shirt in the end, and that's where you know, Unai Emery, so I want his team to improve second half, a bit more kind of end product to these attacks, finishing with a, a cross or a shot. Too many of the attacks have kind of broken down on the edge of Arsenal's 18-yard box. Villa trying to move three points clear of Tottenham Hotspur in the race for Champions League football after a week where, because of the coefficient, we won't go into all the details of that, but simply put, fifth place in the Premier League this season looking a little less likely at the moment in terms of getting an extra Champions League play so it might be all to play for between Villa and Spurs and with that and the title race and the European positions below them and everything that's happening at the bottom of the Premier League table these final few weeks of the season are going to be magnificent for the neutral and for those involved as Arsenal have to hurry the ball away from the byline inside their own half it's gone up towards Pau Torres who is 20 yards at the moment inside Arsenal's half engaged for Villa giving it to Diego Carlos. Here's the Scotsman, John McGinn, scored against Lille on Thursday night in Aston Villa's 2-1 quarter-final win in the Europa Conference League. And back on the halfway line again with Diego Carlos, this Villa defence who were uh, asked to make several late blocks in the first half to deny uh, Villa as Watkins gets it into the box. Zaniolo shoots left-footed, sliding Gabriella at his feet to block it. Back out to the left-hand side again, Villa working it, Zaniolo trying to get the space, it's dropped to Watkins, and Watkins has hooked it towards goal, and over the top of the crossbar as Raya jumps, but knows that it was harmlessly drifting away. They look threatening, Villa. They're able to play through that Arsenal midfield, 
ball into Watkins' feet. He's able to turn. He spots the runner, Zaniolo, left-hand side of the 18-yard box. And he just maybe has one too many touches. That allows, I think, it's Gabriel to get across and get a block on the shot. But they've been good in possession, Villa. Sinchenko running into Musa Diaby, who has got it back. Villa have played well in the first 10 minutes of this second half. They have certainly feel at least like they're a bit more front-footed in terms of their approach as Tielemann picks a hole in the Arsenal midfield and Rodgers brings it forward, the youngster, but scrapping and battling to get it back for Arsenal was Kai Havertz. Yeah, he's just got to release that. And Arsenal in turn, toning over the top as Jesus is offside. And it's a shame for him because it was an immaculate touch to bring it out of the air, yeah. but the flag is raised. Just, he's just running with the ball for too long. He's got Diaby as an option on the right-hand side. He's just remonstrating with Rodgers there, telling him to play the ball to him. They've done a good job, Villa. They've been brave in possession. Arsenal have looked to press. They're trying to press high and done a good job of sucking Arsenal onto them and getting the other side, but... Just losing the ball then in kind of key areas, and on that occasion, you know, we all need to from Rogers needed to release that a bit quicker. There's only a point between these two teams when Villa beat Arsenal earlier in the season. At that point, we were saying Villa in the title race, maybe. At the moment, it is all about the focus on the Champions League, and I think this is a, a rare occurrence today where you might have a portion of Tottenham fans wanting Arsenal to win. There won't be all of them feeling that way, and there certainly won't be too many who will tell you, even if they do. 11 minutes into the second half here and still we await our first goal on an afternoon where Liverpool have been beaten at home by Crystal Palace. 6.06 tonight from half past six. If you want to talk about that with Chris and Robbie, 08085 909 693. Arsenal being held here by Villa, but Erdegaard making pictures, making patterns, shifting it to Trossard, swings it in from the left, caught by Emi Martinez and was calm in doing so. Yes, brilliant goalkeeping. He's already on the move for Trossard, whips that cross in. Really good kind of starting position, just relieving the pressure off his defence. Erdegaard, lovely feet from Erdegaard, as we come to expect, and just plays the ball wide to Trossard, and as I said, really good goalkeeping from Martinez again. Won the FA Cup with Arsenal in 2020. Emi Martinez, you might remember those scenes where he was in tears after the game, having seen off Chelsea. Was at a time really where Martinez wasn't in the Arsenal team. He had 11 years with Arsenal. He only made 38 appearances for the club, seven loan spells during that time. He was an Arsenal player, but only really by registration. Yeah, and I think when he eventually got into the team, I thought he played really well. I yeah. thought it was a little bit harsh when Arsenal got rid of him, but... Yeah, of all the times to shift him, it certainly felt like a strange one, didn't it? As Saka picks the ball up for Arsenal in midfield, gives it to Zinchenko. 0-0, Arsenal going from right to left in this second half on Premier League Sunday here on Five Live on BBC Sounds on the World Service as Zinchenko, the Ukrainian, moves the ball one way, then decides to go the other. Got his first ever Premier League career goal against Aston Villa for Arsenal 14 months ago. Alexander Zinchenko didn't start the game here against Bayern Munich on Tuesday night. Jakub Kivior was in the team, but only for 45 minutes. Here's Erdegaard, now Jesus, 20 yards outside Villa's box, an acceleration of pace, sandwiched out of it by two players, including Yuri Tielemans for Villa. Rice gets it again for Arsenal. His pass is astray of Erdegaard. Villa clip it away, but only back to Arsenal possession again, and there's the tall frame of Declan Rice to pick it back up again with that dark, floppy hair sat on top of his head as he tries to push it through for Ben White, who continued his run from right back, Ben White. Villa have prevented that, but at the moment they're struggling to get hold of the ball just in these last couple of minutes. Arsenal's pressure is telling. Yeah, but that is going to happen. You know, Arsenal are going to have their moments where they, they pen you in, control possession, and clear the ball. You know, he's a little bit isolated at times, Ollie Watkins, so you know, that's when Aston Villa need to just stay really focused and, and concentrated and keep that defensive shape good, and you just got to get through those kind of moments, really absorb the pressure. I think I can see Leon Bailey stripped off, ready to come on for Aston Villa. So Unai Emery is the first one to show his cards here, the former Arsenal manager. He was one of two players that has dropped out of the Villa team today. Remember, this Aston Villa team do not have Douglas Luiz available because of suspension. That is a huge loss from their midfield, but they seemingly so far, as we head towards the hour mark here, are coping relatively well with this situation as 
Zaniolo. Barged out of it by two Arsenal players. Havertz takes it off Saliba, gives it to Erdegaard, right of centre, 15 yards outside Villa's box. Tielemann standing it up into the area for Saka. Torres getting himself in the way, but it's going to be a corner. Torres was trying to let that ball run behind and hope the referee thought it was going to be a goal kick. Yeah, trying to fool the referee there. Could have swung his left leg and possibly kicked that out for a corner, uh, for a throw in. Let's go over the line, hoping the linesman thinks that Saka's had the last touch. We've got the spider cam in the stadium today, which is drifting above the players just below us here. In our commentary position in the West Stand, as Arsenal, from the far right-hand side, will have this corner, almost bang on the hour, but Kayo Saka is preparing to take it. There's plenty of movement inside the six-yard box being provided by Ben White. In it comes, headed away by Rogers, hit by Rice, and he's almost hit the second tier of the three-layered stand here in the north bank it's behind for a goal kick yeah difficult opportunity Villa substitution just looping down from that clearance from Rogers on that far post and he elects to take the strike on on the volley Declan Rice difficult skill so here comes that Villa change then off goes Moussa Diaby who is going to be replaced by Leon Bailey who's had a terrific season for Aston Villa eight goals eight assists in the Premier League alone this season in fact, he's got the third highest expected assists in the Premier League, Leon Bailey. Only Manchester City's Doku and a man we're seeing today, Saka of Arsenal, are above him on that list. Yeah, eight goals, nine assists, I think it is. And he's really got him going this season. Kind of slow start to life as an Aston Villa player. A few injuries to contend with, but been very good this season. Saniolo, has he got a corner on the left? He has, he's done very well to get that out of Ben White. Tried to drag it back round him by the corner flag. It's bounced off the shins of the Arsenal defender. And in front of those 3,000 or so Aston Villa supporters, Villa have a chance just beyond the hour to leave a mark here on this game. 0-0. Yeah, Zaniolo doing a really good job again. It's really difficult, Ben Wyatt, against him. Just the strength of him, strength of him is hold-up play. Done a really good job of getting Aston Villa up the field, drawing another a corner here for his team. Talking of Premier League assists, Yuri Tielemans has got five of them this season, and he's the one who's going to take this corner for Aston Villa on the far left-hand side. So it will be the Belgian with his right foot in swinging to the near post. Arsenal head on it might have been Havertz eventually. Oh, Arsenal have lost it again. Brilliant effort off the crossbar. What a strike from Tielemans. And he's come off the underside of the bar. David Raya was beaten all ends up. And for the second time in this game, Aston Villa have rattled his woodwork. What a strike. Tillemans, does it hit the actual, does it hit the bar and the post and come out? I think it might have done. So, so unlucky. But Zinchenko, there, he's so weak in the challenge with Tillemans. He, he goes in, he doesn't want to win the ball. Tillemans wins it. He's on that left-hand side of the edge of the 18-yard box and he whips a fantastic shot towards that far post. Raya's beaten. It looks like it comes off a combination of the crossbar and the post and comes out. He can't believe it. Tielemans is a right smile on his face. Well, he's a scorer of great goals, isn't he, Yuri Tielemans? That one he got in the FA Cup a few years ago for Leicester that won it against Chelsea. That was of the, the highest order from Yuri Tielemans. I think Kevin De Bruyne against Crystal Palace from a couple of weeks ago and maybe even a level above that because he was further out. Yeah, so, so unlucky, but he's weak in the challenge, Zinchenko, in the 50-50, almost costs him his team. Villa free kick, McGinn swinging it in, Arsenal defending a little ragged, it's dropped down towards Morgan Rogers, who had a couple of Arsenal players around him, then Gabriel Jesus has punched it with his feet away from him, but Bailey's got it back for Villa, now Tielemans has it on the halfway line, being harassed by Saka. Dinia sends it forward from the left-back spot. On it goes from Pau Torres, who's still up there. And then back to goalkeeper David Raya from William Saliba. And the Emirates Stadium with a bit of noise urging their team to find their rhythm again because Arsenal have lost it a bit. But can they regather it here? Saka down the right-hand side. Great game, this. 0-0, Arsenal and Villa. Saka for Jesus. Hit it well. Pushed away by Martinez. Back in by Ben White towards the far post. McGinn seen Jesus out of it. And the offside flag eventually goes up against Ben White, who was following up to that save from Emi Martinez. Yeah, it's a decent save. Martinez diving to his left, a save you would expect him to make, and they just get caught. Villa with bodies up the field. 
And Arsenal break really quickly and just looking at that strike again from Tillman. So, so unlucky. Maya beating all ends up. Whips it over the top of him. Back off the crossbar. Has scored twice before. Oh, my. Yeah, I'm just looking at <laughs> the Yeah, it, it is one of those, crossbar. though, Danny. It really hits is. Hits the crossbar, comes down and hits the foot of the post and comes back out. It's unbelievable. Here they come again, Villa. Watkins trying to get in behind the Arsenal defence. Good defending from Saliba. That's why him and Gabriel have been so talked about in recent months for their expert defensive work, sliding in at the feet of Watkins. But Villa, resurgent, believing. McGinn down the left-hand side. He's got the corner out of Declan Rice. They're on top here at the moment, Aston Villa. They are posing some questions of title chasing Arsenal. Yeah, you can just see that confidence growing. So, so important. Obviously, going in at half-time, still very much in the game. They do look like they've grown in confidence, Villa. There was kind of spaces starting to open up for them. I was going to mention about Tielemans. He scored twice before against Arsenal for Leicester. And he actually was here ten years ago with Anderlecht in the Champions League. They were 3-0 down Anderlecht to Arsenal in that game. And they came back and got something from it. Villa corner. Arsenal changes forthcoming. More on that in a minute. Tielemans towards the near post. Didn't go any further than Jesus, who cleared it away. Back in by Dinia. And then the attempted overhead kick, which... Uh, Morgan Rogers is apologising for, but it's left Martin Erdegaard in a crumpled heap on the floor. Might have been Diego Carlos who actually tried the spectacular there. I'm not sure what he's thinking there, Diego Carlos, as that ball kind of loops up. His back is towards goal. He's going for the acrobatic overhead kick. Erdegaard sticks his head in there. And that did not look nice at all. Completely misses the ball, catches Martin Odegaard. Hopefully this isn't too serious, but looks in a lot of pain. Quite you were sort of wincing as it happened, yeah, weren't you? Yeah, as soon you? as it happened. I'm not quite sure where he caught him. Maybe the chest area. He's back to the goal. He's watching the ball. Eyes completely on the ball. Diego also Carlos, and yeah, this looks like, thankfully for Odegaard, he kind of catches him in that chest area rather than the face. So while Martin Odegaard is needing the treatment, and as Danny Gavidon mentions, it, it's a very good job. It was not about three or four inches higher because it would have been a facial injury rather than one on the chest. We're going to see these Arsenal changes. And they're interesting ones as well because Takahira Tomiyasu, the Japanese international, he is one of those players who is ready to come on here. Ben White is making way for him. And also it is the end of the afternoon for Leandro Trossard who has been so impactful in recent weeks coming off the bench. Six goals as a substitute in all competitions, giving his chance to start the game today. Had that big chance, didn't he, saved by Emi Martinez in the first half. And Gabriel Martinelli comes on for him. Yeah, not a bad replacement. <laughs> <laughs> ben White, well, I did mention he has struggled a little bit against Anioli. He has struggled with his physicality not quite been at the top of his game so can maybe understand that change as well and it does look like Tommy Asu has gone to play in that right back role as well yeah. straight swap position wise been reunited with referee David Coop today take a here Tommy Asu because he was the referee that sent him off at Crystal Palace back in August in the very early weeks of the season Still a super noise in North London on a super Sunday where Liverpool have been beaten and Arsenal have been held at the moment by Aston Villa at home. Nil-nil between these two as Dinia clears it away for Villa from the edge of his penalty area up to Watkins, knocked out of it by Saliba, the Frenchman. And now Zinchenko with his blonde hair and a left-footed pass out towards Tommy Asu. And back in field towards Zinchenko as well, who plays as that inverted fullback. And it's his ball forward into the channel for Martinelli, who's got Konza up against him. And Martinelli's actually offside. And Villa knew, they knew the flag was going to go up against him. Villa are so good at getting those offsides. They've got another one here. Yeah, do play with that high defensive line, but more often than not this season, they have got that right. Catch lots of teams offside. Martinelli on that occasion, not quite up to the speed of the game yet. Just... Makes his run slightly too early. 
So earlier today, Liverpool nil, Crystal Palace won in the Premier League. In the Scottish Premiership, what a scoreline for Ross County. They beat Rangers by three goals to two, so they are still Rangers. Four points behind Celtic, but with a game in hand. We now know who the Women's FA Cup final will be contested between. Tottenham, for the first time ever, are into a final. They'll face Manchester United, who were beaten in last year's final by Chelsea, but beat them today in the semi-finals and later tonight from eight o'clock we'll have live coverage from Augusta with the Masters Arsenal come forward inside Villa's penalty area ball in from Tommy Yasu Diego Carlos there before Gabriel Jesus out of play for an Arsenal throw on the far right hand side this Arsenal team who have been brushing everybody aside in 2024 nobody's got near them bar Manchester City but at the moment the only team that they've dropped points to in the Premier League City since the start of 2024 well, are Aston Villa going to add their name to that list? They're 20 minutes away from doing so. Danny Gavidon. Yeah, 38 goals scored in the last 11 games. Arsenal all conceded. We're pretty much averaging three goals a game. They've been swatting teams aside, as you say, Chris, but find it more difficult this afternoon. Aston Villa done a really good defensive job up until now and had a couple of big moments themselves in this game. Watkins wins the header on the halfway line. Saliba's boot was too high, so it's going to be a, a Villa free kick. He'll try to take it quickly, but the referee is not happy with the position of the ball or indeed the conversations that he was having with the Arsenal players, so has reordered Villa to take this free kick again from just a couple of yards inside their own half. 20 years since Arsenal last won the Premier League title. Got 77 points when they did so. They're on 71 right now prior to this game. They're going to certainly need 80-something this season to win it, and maybe, maybe even 90-something, depending on Manchester City and indeed and indeed Liverpool, despite their defeat today. Yeah, I think the quality of the teams at the, the top of this league now, you know, if you're Man City, if you're Liverpool, I know they lost today, if you're Arsenal, you're thinking we've got to win all of our remaining games, you know, there can be no kind of slip-ups, even a draw obviously cost you the league, so uh, I think mean, that's the mindset of all all of these teams now. Zaniolo's chipped past down the left-hand side beyond Luca Dina, who has moved forward with some pace from that left-back position. As Arsenal have to hurry it away with Gabriel upfield because he was under pressure from the pass given to him on the edge of his box. Martinez is now outside of his penalty area for Villa, the goalkeeper, as they try to continue the momentum that they have built up in this second half it's felt like a different second half to the first 45 minutes for sure yeah, I think Villa have improved on what we saw in the first half they've had a little bit more of the ball a little bit more threatening games opening up a little bit now as well for both teams so we who can take advantage of that here's Gabriel Martinelli starting to run from inside his own half he's had a little pull on Eshri Ponza which hasn't escaped the attention of the referee Quite a few around us who don't agree with that decision. He tries to knock it and put the afterburners on Consa there. He is quick, Martinelli, but he's no slouch either, Consa, and he just kind of gets across the line, Martinelli, and I think he just clips the back of his heels there. It's a good decision from the ref. He's had a magnificent season, hasn't he, Ezri Consa? Got his first uh, England caps yeah, as well last month. Deserved, so, yeah. deserved. He's been knocking on the door with that for a while. Yeah, it felt like a long time coming, didn't it? Free kick for Villa then, Diego Carlos takes it. Bailey tangling with Zinchenko. Ended up on the ground, the Jamaican international, but it wasn't a free kick. And Raya has quickly bowled it out to Tommy Asu, who has come on for Ben White in this second half. 73 minutes coming up on the, the big screen above all those Villa and Arsenal fans on the opposite side of the stadium to us, the southeast side of this stadium. Arsenal from right to left in their red and white home shirts trying to continue the momentum that they've built up in recent months in this Premier League table or are they dropping points just as their title rivals Liverpool did earlier today nil-nil between these two Zaniolo for Villa accelerating away down the left-hand side halfway inside Villa's half now the Italian and on he goes trying to get round the outside of Tommy Yasu as well he's got a corner is he I think he has Nicolo Zaniolo that is brilliant work applauded by Danny Gabadon that's how good it was very very good again He's got nowhere to go, really. He's lacking options, but he drives up that left-hand side, goes away from Odegaard, gets to the byline. Tommy Asu comes across, and he's able to 
get another corner for his team. I have to say the energy levels of Villa have been very good. I thought with Arsenal having two days more extra rest, that might be a factor in this game. But up until this point, 73 minutes gone, hasn't been the case. Yeah, toe-to-toe, -to -toe, lung for lung. Villa are matching Arsenal with every stride, every breath. Another Tielemans corner coming in from that left-hand side. He's put both his arms up into the air. It's at that near post again. It's off an Arsenal head, I think, up into the air. And behind, has Raya stopped it going behind? He hasn't. Villa are going to have another set piece here. Another corner for the visitors. Mm, done a good job up until this point, Arsenal defending these set pieces. After the knock, there has been a, an Arsenal head on it. He does have good delivery, Tielemans. What a delivery of that right boot as well that crashed the Arsenal crossbar earlier in this half. Goalless between Arsenal and Aston Villa. Just over 15 minutes of the 90 to play. And another Villa corner as the Arsenal home supporters try to find the encouragement for their team. Tielemans in towards the near post, picked up by Torres. Torres from the byline, crashed it towards goal. There's a couple of Villa players asking for a handball. In fact, more than a couple, four or five now are asking questions from that Torres lethal effort towards the near post. It's a corner for now. Yeah, so many bodies in that area, really difficult to see. It's whipped into that near post. Pau Torres is looking to twist and turn and get across in. It's definitely not handball. Plays it straight into the chest, the Havertz there was, or Tommy Asu possibly, I think it was. Corner after corner after corner at the moment from fourth place Aston Villa, who began the weekend below Spurs, but right now are above them in the Premier League table in fourth. Tielemans and other towards that near post. His corners haven't been great, to be fair. Cleared away by Jesus, back with Tielemans again. That delivery's taken a deflection as well. Zinchenko inside his box to head it away. Arsenal now might be able to break. Erdogan's got it out of his feet quickly. He's got it to this left-hand side. Arsenal have it with Declan Rice, who has checked in field and tried to swing one from the left to the right for Jesus, who had peeled off. Picked up by Villa, though in midfield, they're on the seconds at the moment, Villa, they got it again with McGinn. Yes, brilliant from Tillemans, that crossfield ball he intercepts, he's the guy that actually takes the corner, Arsenal break and he ends up intercepting that Declan Rice crossfield ball in that left-back position, brilliant work to kind of get back in. Martinez sweeping it out to Dino with the bright orange boots on the Aston Villa defender, here is Zaniolo, over the top looking for Watkins, who's run beyond Saliba, but now has got Gabriel for company. Gabriel is outside of his box on that left-hand side, Watkins has got the ball for Villa, here's Zaniolo, now with Dina. Zaniolo trying to give it back to Luca Dina again, he's now had to go back towards the halfway line for Torres. 77 minutes in, Arsenal nil, Villa nil, Diego Carlos has Mikel Arteta outside of his technical area, arms aloft, barking instructions to his team here. He'll be very aware that this feels a little familiar to Arsenal in moments of April last season. Well, they, can't, they can't think about that, they really can't. Here's Bailey for Villa, right side of the box. Did Martinelli get the ball? He did, Bailey thinks otherwise, he's on the ground, Leon Bailey. Unai Emery has now got his arms outstretched either side of his body. The Villa Spanish manager trying to get the attention of David Koo to ask why it wasn't a free kick for Leon Bailey. It is an Arsenal throw instead. Yeah, I think he just wants uh, to halt play here as well. Emery because zaniolo has gone down on that far side. It would be a blow if they lose him because he's been excellent. Not quite sure if maybe it's a little bit of cramp. He has worked really hard in this game. Also keen to kind of get on with the game quickly. And with Zaniolo down, one of his Italian international teammates is about to come on for Arsenal. Jorginho, one of Arsenal, two changes here Martin from Mikel Arteta. Arteta. Remember, he's already brought on Tommy Yasu and Martinelli. And now he is dipping further into the reserves. And it is going to be Jorginho and Emile Smith-Rowe who are appearing from the bench here. And off go Gabriel Jesus. And is that Martin Erdegaard walking off? Looking away. He has looked a little bit leggy over the last kind of five minutes. Just, just watching him, Martin Erdegaard, and some of his recovery runs and trying to get up with play on some of those Arsenal counter attacks and maybe just uh, lacking a bit of energy. Do have good options though, Arsenal now. This is the strongest squad they've had for a long time. Mikel Arteta. 
Neil Smithrow is on. Mikel Arteta has spoken about him, saying he's a, he's a joy to watch, even if he isn't able to use him regularly in his starting lineup. up Neil Smithrow. But they're going to be relying on him for the creativity now that the master's gone off, Erdegaard. Saniolo is just about getting back to his feet here. Play still That's hasn't restarted, and actually it is going to be a, a Villa change because he cannot carry on Zaniolo. And Alex Moreno, the Spaniard, is coming on for him. Yeah, definitely looked like cramp. He has put a shift in. Zaniolo, he's been very good, rightly getting applauded from the Aston Villa fans over in that far corner as he makes his way round the pitch. Not found himself in the team too often in recent weeks. Alex Moreno was a, a regular in months gone by at the start of the season for Unai Emery. In fact, it was Unai Emery's first ever Aston Villa signing Alex Moreno. Ten minutes to go, plus stoppage time at the Emirates Stadium. Can you sense the nerves in here, or does it does it not quite feel like we're in that territory yeah, yet? It's gone a little bit quiet, but look, there is going to be games like this for Arsenal between now and the end of the season. Isn't all going to be plain sailing like it has been in the last 11 games where they've just been brushing teams aside? There are going to be games like this that are a bit tighter, and you've got to find a way of winning them. It's important that the crowd stay with the team. Arsenal nil, Aston Villa nil, but the best chance of the second half, the one for Yuri Tielemans for Aston Villa, where he crashed the ball off David Raya's crossbar and then off his post as well. One of those where you scratch your head and you think, how on earth did yeah. it stay out? Even the Ollie Watkins one in the first half, how it hits the inside of the post, normally you see them go in. It actually evades then the, uh, the other post, the far side. Saka picking it up on the right-hand side for Arsenal. On the edge of the penalty area, the substitute Jorginho has just come on. In from Saka, looking for Havertz. His downward header was aimed towards the vicinity of Emile Smith-Rowe, but McGinn is there to clear it away. And then Zinchenko takes a heavy touch on the halfway line. Bailey gets it off him for Villa on this right wing. Bailey cutting back in field, then a chop to take it back onto his right foot, and eventually, with nothing on, gives the sensible option of the ball backwards towards Konza. Yeah, it did well in the end to retain possession because he couldn't kind of find that half a yard of space to play that ball in behind, so it did a good job of just keeping hold of the ball. Loose pass by Morgan Rogers, but then there was one that followed as well from Emile Smith-Rowe when he was presented with possession for Arsenal. So Villa have it again. As it stands, they are going to be one point ahead of Tottenham Hotspur in fourth, with Spurs in fifth. And for Arsenal... They are going to be second in the Premier League table on a weekend that is fast hurtling towards being a very, very good one if you are of a Manchester City persuasion. Liverpool beaten by Palace earlier on today on Five Live. You heard the commentary with Ian Dennis and Neil Lennon. Here's Leon Bailey, little layoff, Konza on the move, Zinchenko flat-footed, Konza halfway inside Arsenal's half, on the right, Watkins in the box, Moreno in there as well, delayed his cross and allowed Gabriel to make the block. Oh, the touch from Bailey was beautiful to release Konza down that right-hand side. And he had an early option to just square in it to Moreno, edge of the 18-yard box, he elected to have another touch and then the attack kind of closes up a bit and he's not able to find Ollie Watkins in the end. John McGinn has just taken a piece of paper off Austin McPhee, the Aston Villa set-piece coach, down on the touchline. As uh, McGinn spins away from Kai Havertz, I doubt that was the, the message on the piece of paper. Here's Torres, now Tielemans taking it off him from a short pass, 15 yards inside Arsenal's half. Now McGinn, Arsenal nil, Villa nil, but right now you cannot argue that Villa do not deserve to take something from this game at the Emirates Stadium. Yeah, they've still got work to do. Dinya on the left-hand side, Saka with him in that defensive area, blocks the cross behind, ball bounces into those away Villa fans who are sensing something here, another Aston Villa corner. Yeah, nice little spell of possession there for Villa, Arsenal just sat a little bit deeper in this shape and allowing Aston Villa to progress the ball kind of up the field, they draw another corner, they haven't really made enough of these have they Chris? No, it is Tielemans, though, who's going to have another go at this from that same side over on the left. The same side, I believe, that a couple of seasons ago, Douglas Luiz scored directly from a corner here against Arsenal for Villa. 
He's suspended today. It's a short one this time from Tielemans to the edge of the penalty area. Moreno clipping it in away by Tommy Asu with his head. Then Moreno jumps with Emil Smith row. No free kick though. McGinn's got it again for Villa, but he's quite deep at the moment, McGinn. Down on that left-hand side goes Dina, gets it off Moreno, into the near post, missed by Torres, Bailey's there, he's scored for Villa! Leon Bailey has smashed that ball into the back of the net, and with six minutes to go, Aston Villa are pulling at the threads of Arsenal's title race. It's Arsenal nil, Aston Villa won. Well, it's getting even better for Man City now. Bailey on the far post. They do a really good job, Aston Villa, of kind of recycling possession. McGinn on the edge of the 18-yard box. And they work it down Arsenal's left-hand side, side of the 18-yard box. And it's a really good ball played across the six-yard box. I think it's Pau Torres initially who darts into that near post area. He looks like he might score, he misses it. Goes right across that six-yard box. And Bailey's there on the far post on a tightish angle, weaker right foot. He's able to fire it past David Raya. It's, it's Luca Dina down that left-hand side. He just gets inside Kai Havertz and he fires the ball across that six-yard box. Pau Torres doesn't get there, but he does a really good job of stopping Gabriel getting there. And the ball just evades everyone, goes out to Bailey on that tightish angle. It's a really good finish on his weaker right foot. He doesn't have a lot of the goal to hit there. David Raya scrambling across. Shows great composure on the finish. Wow. That is a huge, huge goal, possibly, in this title race. For the first time in 2024, Arsenal are behind in a Premier League game. How significant could that goal from Leon Bailey be? And how much character is there in this Arsenal camp? Because now we're going to find out. They've won a corner. There's five minutes to go. But Arsenal are losing at home to Villa, just as their title rivals, Liverpool, were beaten at home earlier today by Crystal Palace. And they've been in such good form, Arsenal have been making these results, these wins look so, so easy. It's not been so easy this afternoon. Villa have been excellent, now they get their nose in front. Saka swinging it in, won by Rodgers, but it's not gone out of the penalty area. Saliba jumped and missed it. Tielemans has scooped it up into the air, but he hasn't got a great deal of distance on that either. Zinchenko immaculately bringing it out of the sky. And then misplaced by Jorginho. And Watkins from the halfway line has timed his run perfectly. He might be beyond here. It's Ollie Watkins. Smith Rowe is with him. Watkins delicately lifts it wow. over the goalie. And Aston Villa have scored again. It's Ollie Watkins who scored again. 26 goals this season for Ollie Watkins. He is having the season of all seasons. And Arsenal right now shaking heads, looking in despair because they've conceded two quick goals to Aston Villa. Remarkably, the scoreline now is Arsenal nil, Aston Villa two. What a finish, Ollie Watkins. The audacity, the composure to dink it over David Raya. And he's definitely off, not offside, he runs from in his own half as he gets played in. It's Arsenal turning the ball over. Jorginho looks to play a ball in behind. It's cut out by Tillemans. He sees the runner Watkins. And it's Samuel Smith, though, who's desperately trying to get back in. And he does a really good job of holding him off. And he takes it onto his right foot. And it's just a little dink. Possibly takes a little nick off the first Smith, though, over the top of David Raya. It's a wonderful finish, it really is. Incredible, Chris, incredible. I'd love to know if anybody predicted Liverpool and Arsenal losing at home on this Sunday afternoon on Five Live. Arsenal nil, Aston Villa 2. There are Arsenal fans with fingernails in mouths, shaking heads because this right now for the Gunners and we will talk about how brilliant Villa have been in this second half in just a moment but right now this feels like deja vu for them I have to say I didn't see this one coming you know I thought they could trouble them Aston Villa 2-0 up I really didn't see that you have to say they've been excellent second half kept themselves in the game in the first half Aston Villa had that big chance with Watkins in the first half that hit the post They've been really, really good second half. They've kept Arsenal quite restricted them. Mikhail Sack on our answer. We haven't seen too much of him second half. 
And Unai Emery, Unai Emery on his return to the Emirates Stadium, the former Arsenal manager, masterminding one of the best performances of Aston Villa's season. It certainly will be one of the very best results of their season if they hang on to this two-goal lead. But is there anything left in the Arsenal tank? 2-0 down, here's Martinelli, deep inside Villa's half, on the left, low ball in, up into the sky from Diego Carlos, caught by Emi Martinez, and no surprise to see him drop on top of the ball. Yeah, no surprise to see Diego Carlos on the end of that cross there as well. He's been like a magnet, he's defended magnificently, he's contributed massively to this Aston Villa performance. Now they've got the goals on top of it. You never doubted Ollie Watkins, did you, when he went through? In fantastic form this season, and he always seems to pick the right finish. Great composure, execution on the finish, the dink over the goalkeeper. Ollie Watkins, the boyhood Arsenal fan, with the second Villa goal. And the celebration over by the corner flag in front of the Villa fans, as if he'd just sort of finished a, a two hours of a London a London show in a theatre, yeah. the, the waving of the hands, as if to say, thank you very much, that's me done for the night. Yeah. 19 goals, 10 assists for Watkins this season. Incredible. Yeah, and that's in the Premier League alone. He's only one behind Erling Haaland in that golden boot race. And you'd be very, very brave to stick your neck out and say it will be Haaland's again. Arsenal coming forward down the left with Martinelli. Wasn't a good ball for him, though. It was a little short from Nketiah, who has come off the bench for Arsenal amongst the pandemonium as McGinn slides into the challenge on the halfway line. Eight minutes of stoppage time, but Arsenal are going to need one of those, those great gunners' reprieves that we have seen here before. We did see in the early portions of last season. They're going to be relying on that experience now. They're 2-0 down. Danny Gabidon. Yeah, and balance has been the word that we've used so much for this Arsenal team this season. Defended magnificently and scoring lots of goals, but they just get caught with bodies up the field on that second goal, maybe just chasing things, trying to get back in the game. That ball goes in behind, and it's actually Emil Smith Rose, the man who's trying to track Ollie Watkins and get back and do something to stop him. He's not able to. Nicely worked by Arsenal on that right hand side. They've got a corner here, the cross deflected off Alex Moreno from Tommy Asu, who is desperate to go and get the ball. I thought it had gone out for a corner. It hasn't. It's gone out for an Arsenal throw instead, but we've played a minute now of the eight of stoppage time. Arsenal need two goals just to get a point here. Their unbeaten record, their almost perfect record of 2024, bar that draw with Manchester City. And that's hardly drop points at the Etihad. Well, this really is drop points today, losing at home to Villa. Yeah, looks like Villa are going to do the double over them. Yeah, great point, Danny. They beat them back in December 1-0 as well at Villa Park. Back when we were saying Villa were title contenders. At the moment, in terms of the title, the ball has just moved significantly into Manchester City's court. This is Saka. Can he pull something out of the bag for Arsenal? Flicked into the box. Smith Rowe, right of centre, tried to pull it back for Nketiah. Jorginho, Tommy Asu didn't really want it, never really looked comfortable. He's got it back to Jorginho on the edge of the penalty area. Now Gabriel. They're all forward inside the final third here, Arsenal's players. Tommy Asu swinging it in, and Ketia on his chest, couldn't get the volley away. Back to the edge of the box, Bailey and Rice collide. Foul by the Arsenal midfielder on Leon Bailey, who got that first Villa goal, and the visitors have a free kick. Yeah, two Aston Villa players down. Diego Carlos being one of them, Leon Bailey the other. Really important clearance again from Diego Carlos. He has been magnificent for them. This afternoon he's been right at the heart of this performance. Magnificent defensive display, he's been in the right place at the right time so, so often. Defended really well, Villa, and then taking their chances in the second half. Just looking at that Watkins finish again. It's outrageous, it really is. Just the mark of a man who whose confidence levels are at 100% right now. Yeah, not quite been at it second half, Arsenal. Maybe the energy levels, I don't know, from the work they had to put in in midweek, to get a result against Bayern, not quite looked as sharp as uh, maybe what we thought. And that's the other aspect of this, because Arsenal have got to then go to Bayern Munich on Wednesday off the back of this. Live on Five Live, Sports Extra on Wednesday evening, we'll have Real Madrid 
at Manchester City as well on the same night. And we'll look at those fixtures in just a moment for Arsenal and indeed for Aston Villa, who of course are playing Lille, so they're in France on Thursday night in the second leg of their Europa Conference League. But they are 2 0 up here, Aston Villa, and they have delivered a majestic second half performance, topped with that brilliant Watkins goal. Is there more to come? Bailey poking it in, Watkins for another one, saved by Raya, got a hand to it, David Raya, decent save from him. Offside flag was raised anyway. Villa at the moment are on the up. Brilliant football. You know, they're trying to get a third. Yeah, Bailey maybe just straight offside, but the football's brilliant on this right hand side to release Bailey. Cuts it back inside to Watkins. He dances in between two players with his first touch and he's trying to poke it past Raya. Makes a good save, but it was offside. Down the other end, Arsenal with Martinelli. Rice from 30 yards over the top of the crossbar. Puts his hands on his head, rubs that thick black hair of his Declan Rice, the ironic cheers from the Aston Villa supporters, the stern faces of those in red and white in the home crowd with arms folded and right now wondering, wondering if Arsenal's title push is crumbling again. Their next Premier League games, Wolves away, Chelsea at home, the North London derby at Spurs, Bournemouth at home, Man United away, Everton at home. They are the final fixtures for Arsenal of their Premier League season, but they are going to need a mighty reset after this. Yeah, it just shows how difficult this league is, Chris. You know, nothing is a given. You know, look at the form Arsenal have been in, into this game. Being at home as well, you, you just fancy them not really to drop any points between now and the end of the season, but... Uh, Got to give a lot of credit to Aston Villa, the way they have performed. You know, going into this game themselves with just the one win in the last five games and looking at maybe they're not quite at the top of their game when you really need to be at the business end of the season, but the way they responded after a good result in midweek against Lille to come to the, the Emirates and perform to this level deserve a lot, a lot of credit, they do. Yeah, Manchester City put four past them a couple of weeks ago at the Etihad. Arsenal have not been able to score against Aston Villa today and we're in the sixth minute of stoppage time remember eight indicated the ball is back with Emi Martinez who doesn't take any chances inside his six-yard box clobbers it up to the halfway line one by Saliba for Arsenal who are 2-0 down at home to an Aston Villa side have only won one of their last five in the Premier League and are going three points clear of Tottenham Hotspur and really getting a grip of that fourth Champions League spot here Villa with this victory which is impending you feel unless there's a very late Arsenal show here's Smith Rowe Saka on the right of Villa's penalty area Jorginho on the edge of it Jorginho into the box Tommy Asu's layoff in Ketia great defending from Villa again that is superb stuff was that Diego Carlos chucking himself in there yeah, I think it's John McGinn. was it McGinn yeah, yeah it was McGinn yeah and no. he, he's been in there yeah. as good as those Villa centre-halves, yeah, hasn't him, he? Him and Tillemans have done a fantastic job in that midfield area. Not just kind of getting forward, Tillemans with his passing range, linking that midfield to the attack, but they've both done a brilliant job of kind of dropping in at times, protecting that back four, almost in the back line at times when those balls are in and around the 18-yard box and getting vital blocks in and vital tackles in, both of them being absolutely magnificent in the absence of Douglas Louise. The away end is bouncing, as you can imagine. Those Villa fans right now are enjoying this. They don't get too many victories at, at Arsenal. In fact, they're, of their last six visits to the Emirates Stadium, they've only picked up points on one occasion. They won here, and that was when there were no crowds allowed in. Here's Watkins trying to escape again. Whistle's gone, though. It's going to be an Arsenal free kick. 6.06 to come with Chris and Robbie, 0805 909 693. They're not going to be short of talking points tonight with Liverpool and now Arsenal set to be beaten. Yeah, just looking at Bukayo Saka, they just went down there under that challenge and he has been very quiet second half. He was involved heavily in that first half, but second half, they haven't really seen him get a lot of the ball. Also, he's carrying a knock, he did get a knock in the first half, but... Danny, the thing that's just struck me, look, look around the Emirates Stadium. There are so many empty seats in here. It feels like 30% of the home crowd have gone. Well, the Masters is on as well, Chris, soon. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a few of them want to get home to watch the golf, I don't know. But, um, yeah, they've seen enough, these Arsenal fans. McGinn 
clipping it out to the right hand side for Leon Bailey. Watkins is in the middle. Arsenal are trying to get bodies back. Bailey is uninterested in running into the penalty area. He's going to run down towards that corner flag. Eat up a few more seconds for Aston Villa, and there are only a few more seconds left. They are closing in on a magnificent afternoon. Aston Villa and Unai Emery, the former Gunners manager, back here for the first time in a domestic game. He came here with Villarreal a couple of seasons ago, knocked Arsenal out of the Europa League at the semi-final stage. This will feel big for him. There will be big celebrations in the Villa camp as the ball goes back to Emi Martinez. A look at the watch from referee David Coote, puts his whistle to his mouth. Arsenal have been beaten in the Premier League for the first time in 2024. They have been stung by Aston Villa. Late goals from Leon Bailey. A brilliant second from Ollie Watkins. What an afternoon for Unai Emery. Back at the Emirates Stadium. What a weekend for Manchester City at the top of the table. Liverpool beaten. Arsenal beaten. Manchester City top of the tree on this Sunday night. Danny Gavidon. Incredible. Incredible performance by Aston Villa. Didn't see this one coming, coming into the game with the form that Arsenal have been in, the form or the current form that Villa have been in. But they deserve massive amounts of credit. The first half kept themselves in it. Arsenal, two or three good chances, weren't able to convert. The second half, I thought Villa were the better side. I thought they controlled Arsenal really well. Maybe Arsenal in the energy level, second half, not quite there. Look at Arteta making changes trying to affect the game that didn't really work either and then Villa get that second goal get that breathing space and we're able to see the game out fairly comfortably in the end so huge huge result for Villa in terms of the, the race for the top four that bit of a three-point cushion now between them and Tottenham and a huge huge blow for Arsenal in terms of the title challenge look there's still a lot of time to go points to play for but you feel it's advantage Man City now Incredible day, Liverpool losing and Arsenal as well. Just didn't see it coming at all. Plot twist to end all plot twists on Five Live this afternoon. Liverpool losing at home to Crystal Palace in our two o'clock live commentary. And here at the Emirates Stadium, as the Aston Villa players embrace, they have come to Arsenal, impeccable Arsenal in recent months. Bailey in the 84th minute, Watkins in the 87th, and it has finished remarkably. Arsenal nil. Aston Villa 2. So it's a day where Aston Villa essentially do a North London double, um, whipping the rug out of Arsenal's title challenge with a 2-0 win, and also putting themselves three clear of Spurs in the race for fourth place, which guarantees a Champions League spot next season. I mean, we haven't really got a great deal of time to reflect on it, Danny. I was just a little bit surprised second half, the lack of fight from Arsenal there. Yeah, the lack of energy, I think, Fletch, as well. I don't know if uh, midweek maybe caught up with them, uh, the game against Bayern, but they didn't really offer too much second half. You know, it was a game went on, you know, we spoke about it, Fletch, at half-time. The longer the game kind of went on at 0-0, would Arsenal kind of get edgy, looking to find a way to kind of get in front? Villa would kind of grow in confidence, and that's exactly what happened as the second half went on. And, and I, I thought Villa looked the more dangerous. They were the better team. You know, Tillemans was unlucky hitting the crossbar not to put Villa in front. You're expecting that kind of reaction from Arsenal, and it, it kind of never really came. It was comfortable for Villa in the end. Once they got that second goal, it was very easy for them to kind of see the game out. Um, we, I just didn't expect that from Arsenal with a form that they've kind of been in flat. So um, that is a big, big surprise for me, that result. But I think all credit to Aston Villa. You know, the game plan was actually spot on. The way they defended Diego Carlos in particular, I thought was absolutely magnificent. Zaniola on that left-hand side did a great job in terms of kind of retaining possession for them. And Ollie Watkins gets two chances in the game, hits the post in the first half, makes no mistake with uh, the chance in the second half. And that was the one that really killed Arsenal off. So a uh, big, big result for Villa. And it's going to be really interesting to see how Arsenal respond to this one now. Danny, Chris, thank you. What a fascinating day it's been. The Premier League table after 32 matches. Manchester City top, 73 points. Arsenal second, 71. Liverpool third, 
71. It's been a memorable day. Um, thanks to Chris, thanks to Danny, thanks to everybody who's contributed on the programme today. That's all from me on a massive day in the Premier League title race. Liverpool lose and Arsenal lose. And don't forget, in Scotland, Rangers lost as well. It's been quite a day. Don't forget, from 8 o'clock tonight, Mark Chapman live from Augusta National for the conclusion of this year's Masters. 6.06 with Robbie and Chris. I wonder what they're going to be talking about tonight coming up here on Five Live. First, it's the BBC News with James Wickham. Listen on BBC Sounds. This is BBC Radio 5 Live. The G7 group of nations, which includes the UK, has unequivocally condemned Iran's attack on Israel and called for restraint. World leaders have been meeting this afternoon to discuss the attack, in which more than 300 drones were fired. It's the first time Iran has directly fired on Israel. It's unclear how Israel plans to respond, but the War Cabinet Minister Benny Gantz says it will exact a price for Iran's attack when the timing is right. Iran had been warning that it would retaliate after an Israeli strike killed Iranian military commanders in Damascus earlier this month. We'll have a full news update on the events from the Middle East at half past seven this evening. In other news, more than 250 survivors of a bomb attack at Manchester Arena seven years ago are taking legal action against MI5. They believe the intelligence service missed a significant opportunity to prevent the suicide bombing. And a man who lost his sight three years ago has become the first blind person to complete a marathon without being tethered to another runner. Yaya Pandor finished the Manchester Marathon with the help of voiced instructions from a nearby guide. The 28-year-old completed the course in four hours and 22 minutes. Europe's elite club competition. The Champions League. Wednesday night at eight. It's the Champions League double bill. BBC Radio 5 Live. Manchester City versus Real Madrid. And over on 5 Sports Extra. Bayern Munich versus Arsenal. The margins are very small in this competition and that's the biggest lesson. The Champions League. On 5 Live. And on 5 Sports Extra. Listen on BBC Sounds. Are you ready to have your say in the UK's biggest football debate? Your teams, your views. Get ready. This is 6.06.